Episode XLIII, The Presenter Awakens. These are joyous times for the two critical podcasts. Contact has been made in the Napa Valley, and new hope has sprung forth in the form of the one who can restore balance back to television wine show presenting, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Joe Fatterini is here with an episode so big that not even Boba Fett would ask for seconds. We discuss the legacy and history of wine, the film Stepbrothers, and Joe's unhealthy obsession with Tom's wife. Rob, hold the camera steady. You're my only hope. Will Obi-Wan Kenobi finish his latest marathon? Will Rob stop drinking long enough to go back to work? How many times will Joe get up in the middle of the night to have a piss? Only time will tell. Welcome to the Two Critical Podcasts. I'm just going to come out and say it. I'm ready to take on the Catalina wine mixer. I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to come and enjoy the charcuterie board. I'm going to come enjoy your wife. You get back here, you make love to my wife! It's been a while since I've used, you know, wine words. Are we allowed to swear on this? You fucking ain't right. Yes. No speaking, you bitches. Look at the legs on that. My mug says get shit. No. This wine tastes of chew it. Bring us some fresh wine. No more of this old stuff. A demonstration in expert wine tasting by none other than Joe Fatterini. He doesn't realize he's dealing with sophisticated people here. So this is going to be episode 43 of the Two Critical Podcast. This is probably the one I've been most excited about. And I'm, no no lie, a little nervous. Um, so our guest today is a gentleman named Joe Fatterini. If you're not familiar with Joe Fatterini, you probably don't drink wine. And you should probably start. Um, Joe Fatterini is the presenter of a show called The Wine Show. Um, so did we ever figure out where it landed? It used to be on Hulu. Acorn right? and Sundance is it's where it on, is. Is it the Sundance channel or like a subsidiary? Yes. It is the Sundance channel. Okay. I, I believe. Okay. So you can find all sorts you of You can clips. just go on YouTube and just Google That's Wine right. Show. Full yeah. episodes are on YouTube too. And Joe has done, Joe did a bunch of awesome shows on his own YouTube channel, um, during lockdown where he was basically doing like a one man wine show at home. Um, but he would also zoom with like a bunch of, uh, guests, uh, which was really cool. And he was essentially doing it right out of his house. Um, so the wine show has been on for three seasons and Oh, Joe Fatterini has entered the chat. Are we ready for this? I was born ready. This is a big one. Here we go. Joe Fatterini. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, episode 43 of the two critical podcasts we don't deserve this man but he's here um so here we go joe fatterini presenter of the wine show joe how nice to see you how are you oh listen to that voice already my goodness it's like slipping into silk sheets fantastic (laughs) i cannot believe that there's already um, me in my Obi Wan Kenobi costume, oh. about which I have a story. That costume nearly killed me, literally, nearly so killed me. You, how far was that race that you ran in that episode? It's a full marathon, so it's twenty six point four miles. Lord, my God! Um, it was a full marathon. Can I tell you that story? Can we dive yes. straight into this? Is this okay? Of course, Joe. First of all, thank you so much for coming on. I'm Thomas. This is my partner Rob. Welcome to the Two Critical Podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Thomas, Rob, I never need, well, I, I usually do need asking twice, cause, but that's only because I'm horrendously disorganized. It's not because I absolutely, I mean, we are going to talk about my favorite subject, which is is me. So in, um, we, we get. We're going <laughs> no, to rename the story. whole show. Yes. <laughs> this is completely true. This is the danger of making a wine television program. So we there is this marathon. It is in Bordeaux uh, in an area called the Medoc. So it's on the left bank, the south bank of, uh, of the River Gironde. And you go through all these vineyards. And it's the full, full thing. And some people run it properly as a really hard marathon. They come in in amazing times. Um, but it's in fancy dress for the most part. It's tens of thousands of people in fancy dress. And each year there is a theme. So the year we we went and filmed it, uh, it was legends and something or other. It was something is all to do with legends. So we decided that I would be famous Obi-Wan. characters in, in American literature, and you of course yes. went Obi Wan Kenobi. Yep. yep. <laughs> so I went Obi Wan Kenobi. Another people there was, there was uh, a friend of mine who's a winemaker. Um, 
Damien Sartorius, and he went as as a team. People often do it as teams. So he yeah. was Snow White and the Seven. Uh, no, it wasn't. He was Cinderella okay. and her valet valets. We pronounce okay. it valet in the UK. Valet. Um, the campest valets I've ever seen, wearing these sort of pink rubber hot pants, um, and Cinderella uh, was bearded but beautiful. Um, right. And I remember at one point him running up a hill, going "Chase me, chase me!" like this as he goes up. No, so I was there, and they got me literally that outfit. So right. I was there, but you know, I was ready to go on that. What was the ice moon called? Where half, half, yes, yeah. yes. And he goes and hides in the guts of one of those creatures. Yep. This was, I mean, this was really hot. This was like 82, 83 degrees. I've right. got three layers of this costume on. Yep. So we set off, I felt kind of fine. And gradually I started shedding layers and layers of this clothing. I was getting hotter. And one bit that came off, one of the crew, she said, I weighed it and it was it was 10 kilograms. Well, that was like 22 pounds. <laughs> and it was just a sweat. And she was like, are you drinking enough? Because... This is a four or five pound costume right, that's right. got that weighs twenty two right. pounds. You've lost a lot of weight in yeah. sort of fluid. So anyway, I, I was, but mostly in wine. Was it was it a cheap version of the of the costume, or was no. it it was was it wool or like it was like deluxe? Oh. It was it was studio quality. That's fantastic. So all of your sweat got absorbed into that robe, and it just got heavier and heavier. Yeah. Wow. And we ran it in this weird way because we had to film it. So there's me and there's a couple of other people. So there's Matthew Good, who's on the wine show with me. There was his brother who had just run the Marathon des Sables in the desert. So okay. he was kind of up for this. There's another guy, Jamie, who had just run the whole of South America on his own All of it. for 365 days. He'd run every day, run a marathon a day for more than a, for a year. What's he running from? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, <laughs> daddy, daddy. Oh. <laughs> Look at me, I'm doing well. <laughs> say, say well, Tom. The family That's portrait amazing. facing them on the treadmill every day. If you yeah. ever want to understand most, certainly British middle-aged men of a certain social class, it is somebody aged eight or nine looking out of a window, going, why are you driving away, <laughs> leaving me here? Why have you left me? For the last eight years, you've loved me entirely, and now I'm here. And who's he? Oh, no, I'm being pulled away. And school teachers dragging you into churches and oh, getting I, you up at half past six in the morning. That transcends all cultures, I think. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, don't so we, we, put, all, we all go running South Africa right. when that happens, right? <laughs> South America. We did the same yeah. thing. We just got beat by um, Irish nuns. So it all comes you put it in a little box and then you lock the <laughs> key and you throw the key away. We don't talk about it. You just go running. Right. I used to do Ironman triathlons, did three. And somebody said, you know, what's it like? I said, the front line of an Ironman triathlon is a lot of middle-aged men with issues. Sure. It's just all it is. Yep. So here we, I should tell you something. It's costume. So I run around and I go and do this thing. And, and we ran it. We actually ran it as four sort of six mile 10k runs because we had to film so what would happen is we would sort of film something and then they would go no you're really late you're going to get cancelled from the marathon so then we'd have to leg it for six miles and then we would film another little bit but now by that time that this sort of sweep up van would arrive and go, oh no bugger right and we'd run on so we ran this whole thing actually quite quickly but with these insanely long breaks all the time and you drink, you drink at all these marathon stations. Oh this is like God. 20 chateaus that you right. drink at. Okay. And you eat oysters and beef. It's a and perfect combination. Chocolate. Oysters, it's the weirdest wine. meal. Yep. That's and what Prefontaine did, I think. <laughs> and then you get to the end and there's vomit, quite a lot of it actually, around the various places. And we got across, we crossed the line in six hours, 27 minutes. And I remember somebody saying that's terrible. And I was like, no, no, because if you run quicker, because the cutoff is six and a half hours, I think it is. So the, was it seven and a half hours? It was a very long time. The cutoff was it was there. So they said, if you run it any quicker, you didn't drink enough. And if you run it and they slow, you didn't run enough. In, in um, your defense, if the oysters were pre-shucked, you would have cut your time way down. You would have been, to yeah. totally. And also, I would still have both my thumbs, which right. would be great. <laughs> so we get across the line and I kind of held it together for about 15 minutes. And um, then I waited until the, 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 the cameras were put away and then collapsed and properly collapsed and ended up having to go to hospital. And I was so horrendously dehydrated that I went into a kind of spasm 
and a fit. Um, bless the producer, Melanie. She said she'd never come that close to killing a TV presenter in her career. And, and I think so she tried. So far. Fingers so crossed. So far. So far. Yep. So, oh, it was utterly terrifying. And many, it's the, it was the last medics, marathon I've run, actually. How many medics do they have with you guys on a regular basis? Is there a show medic that's there all the time? Did they have there are, that day? There are some serious risk assessments to do. Because we have done... I mean, not sort of daft stuff, but, you know, you do things and you realise it could go horrendously wrong. You know, so you've done things like with, I've been shut in a barrel yes. um, and rolled around. And then the boys you guys rolled, slid down oh. the, um, <coughs> the streets. In those, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the boys rolling the barrels around. And winemaking itself is quite a, I mean, winemaking genuinely is one of the world's more, slightly more sort of dangerous professions. I mean, I've only ever had it once, and it wasn't actually with the wine show, but the thing that tends to kill people in wineries is carbon dioxide, because it's fermenting, and, and carbon dioxide is slightly heavier than air. Okay. Famously, there's an awful story. This is very gloomy. Um, there's an awful story in Germany. There's these cellars, I think, in the Wachau, and on average, two people a year die in their cellars in the Wachau, but nobody ever dies on their own. So it always happens in pairs. And I said to this guy, how? And he said, well, they, they have these dog cellars, and what happens is he said it's always like an older winemaker, usually older guys, and they go in and they forget to turn on the carbon dioxide fans to sort of flush the cellars out. And so the awful tragedy is they go in and you die very quickly from CO2 poisoning and uh, during fermentation. And it often happens in the spring because the fermentation will stop in the middle of winter because it'll go very cold. Okay. And it restarts again in sort of March. Okay. So they didn't realise that there's been these fermentations and that the whole thing's now filled with CO2. They said the awful thing is, of course, what happens is somebody goes like, where's dad? And so they go. And then it's normally their son sees him at the bottom of the stairs, legs it into the cellar to get oh his dad out. And then he dies at the same time. And so they always find them like in, in pairs. And I once got carbon dioxide poisoning at a winery. I shouldn't say who it is because it'd be horrified. But in Venice, the winemaker told us not to do it. He said, you can't shut the doors. You've got to have the doors open. And there was too much traffic noise. It was filming something else. And, um, and I started to pass out. And it was because I was the shortest person in the room. I always am. And so I'm, I'm, I'm right starting to yeah. sort of like this. And the hangover from carbon dioxide poisoning is horrific. It's absolutely awful. So, so I was just outside. So I, I just imagine that the label for that particular winery is just a, a bird cage with a dead bird at the bottom of it. Is that a, or probably just a rejected label? Um, why don't they have the technology that monitors that? Can they not have, uh, like vent ventilation systems would, would, yeah. are they worried about getting dirt into no, not at the all. process or and the amazing thing is if you think about wine which is such an extraordinarily diverse industry it's not like coke you know there's like three people making the thing do you know which is the only country in the world where coke We're talking or about cocaine now no co co coca cola oh no, no there's only one, one country in the world i know there's a short there's a shortage right now in the states are you aware of that it's almost 12 dollars for six pack I've, I've seen this. I mean, I right. don't tend to drink it very much. There's one country in the world where Coca-Cola uh, Coca or Pepsi is not the brand leader. Anybody know where it is? Portugal. No, it's not. How dare you? It's, well, um, when, I was, when I was in Portugal, I didn't see a lot of it. Sumal was much more popular there. But that's, I'm um, not as well-traveled as Joe, so I'm, I'm, I, I had to throw that guess out there. Uh, it's Scotland. Really? Oh. Yeah, and in Scotland, everybody drinks a drink called Iron Brew which is sort of orangey and is an amazing hangover cure. It's this sort of sickly, fluorescent orange drink. You've never had a kind of... It brew. sounds like they rebranded Moxie to me. <laughs> it's extraordinary. Um, so no, it's this amazingly diverse industry. So you've got lots and lots of people in all kinds of different places. And we get, it's great, you go and visit them and they're kind of fun and they're weirdos. And there's Maynard James Keenan and he's a you know rock star and he's kind of making it. Right, and then you get right. somebody whose family have been making it for a thousand years. So there's this bizarre sort of array. And in fairness, absolutely everybody is really good. People are really on to health and safety. Um, and it's always human error. It's always somebody forgets. Sure. Um, there was once a case I know there was a winemaker in uh, in Australia and she had um, a guy and he he was she just said he was he, he was always breaking the rules and they were always saying to him you keep doing that you will die and he did and he and one day he came in and he was sort of stroppy and he climbed into a vat and then the next thing they found him and he was dead. No, it sounds terrible. You know, you get quite a lot of you know you, you get a lot of wine being made. There's actually relatively few people cark it whilst right. they're making it, but it is quite a dangerous place in some ways. So we did, you know when we go away we're all 
always incredibly sort of safety conscious because you've got mechanical equipment and there's people with this and that. And also, you know, I'm being asked to do slightly stupid stuff, like carry, what was it? It was one sort of thing I had to carry about 120 pounds, 140 pounds of stuff on my back. We just watched it last week where you cut your finger. And I cut my finger. Yeah. Which was like nothing. <laughs> like, oh, cut my finger. Yeah, but you don't expect to be bleeding and broken in the first, you know, ten minutes or so of of what you what you're trying to put on camera. Not at all. No, right. no. And I say that. I now look at winemakers who are like missing three fingers and stuff. You know, all kind of all over the shop. And you go, well, maybe that happens more often than not. But no, no absolutely not. That was amazing. You realise we talk about this thing called terroir. So terroir. Sometimes people say is the soil. And then it's not really. Some people go, oh, it's the soil and it's the climate. And other people say, oh, it's the soil and it's the climate and the sort of personality of the people around. It is genuinely the case that today the terroir of German wines is Polish people and Romanians. It's literally impossible to go and make most wines in those vineyards without people who are prepared to come in and do it. And the right. only people who are prepared to come in and do it are people from particularly places like Moldova, Romania, Poland, okay. uh, some of those kind of states. And apparently these, they weren't there because it wasn't harvest particularly when they were there, but it was, he said, these guys are absolute machines. And the same guys have come for, I think, 12 years. And he said, seriously, they, they literally would run up where you could only make it for about 10 yards. He said, they jog up these slopes. It's unbelievable strength of these people who are doing it. So they're the total superstars. And they do something else the rest of the year. They come right. Back. And it's lots of fun. So I'd launch straight into this, but that's, that's fine. That's great. We like to, to jump in head first. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so I've been watching the wine show since, since it came on. Um, I remember one night my wife and I just stumbled across it. Um, and our Friday nights used to be making a, a charcuterie plate and opening up a nice bottle. And we would sit down to watch your show. And, by the end of we, we would go through two three episodes and we had had four bottles of wine <clears throat> the show <laughs> it's fantastic but it, it became a great you know a, a night that we look forward to to watch the show and god bless you we would get together on the couch and we would we would toast our wine glasses in front of the tv we take a picture and we tweet it out to you and i have to say we communicate with a lot of people on social media you're easily within five to 20 minutes. You respond almost every single time. It's, it's actually quite remarkable. And, uh, I'll never forget the first time it happened. Cause we were, we were proper, properly wallpapered. I think when we had sent out that first tweet and, uh, and I said to my wife, I'm like, he just texted me. He just tweeted me back. He, he liked the post. He tweeted us back. So, um, we've been watching it ever since. And, uh, we turned a lot of people onto it. There's a lot of times when we're out with other couples and we'll say, do you guys watch the wine show? And then we'll just launch into this whole thing about, you know, the places that you travel. And we we really enjoyed the aspect of cooking with pairing the wines. Um, we make bolognese all the time. And um, that's when we got on to uh, Zalimbruska. Oh, well, Lambrusco. Yeah, you're you Lambrusco. When you get right. when you go to those drier sort of Lambruscos. Because everything's of Lambrusco as being this sort of sweet, frothy thing. And you, you can't be frothy. It was, like, but... it was like a party wine. It was very inexpensive. Yeah. And people would just bring it to parties and such. So, um, you know, we would go out and find those things. And we would track down certain wines that you had talked about on the show. We got my parents involved in it who were uh, really big wine drinkers. And um, it's just a, it's a fantastic show. It's extremely entertaining. Uh, I love the fact that, you know, you pair it up with um, the actors and you send them out on their, their little missions and things like that. Um, the locations are out of this world. And uh, from a, a production standpoint, the production value is, is so great to watch. Um, all the drone shots <coughs> and all those, those vistas, it, a lot of times it feels like a Western when you're watching it, these big, wide open sort of vista shots that you guys do. Um, I love the part of that. Uh, it, it's just well, then, actually that means a lot because you know obviously you guys watch lots of films and tv and movie and you know, you know that and i know you know when we spent a lot of money but we put it on the screen so a lot of that thing was like how much money do we put on the screen and so you know and, and the format was always that sort of sense wine is really hard to put on tv 
on the whole. And it, even to a point, there's a British show, Alan Partridge. It's sort of ridiculous. Yep. If you haven't watched it, everybody go and yep. watch Alan Partridge. Yep. And there's a quite famous early one where there's a, they make a joke almost about the, the idea of making a genuinely popular wine TV show, as though it's such an utterly ludicrous thing to go and do. <sighs> Oh, that's slightly hyperventilated then. Because actually it was, it was very difficult. I mean, one, a bad wine looks kind of the same as a good one. You don't get to do the same stuff that you do in a food show. Mostly they tend to be either organised around or done by wine people who are interested in wine in a totally different way to most people. So most people live like you. I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to come and enjoy the charcuterie board. I'm going to come enjoy your wife. I'm going to enjoy your sofa. You're not going to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm across. I'm going to start calling your parents, mom and dad. Just like Star Wars characters. It's going to be great. Like Star Wars I'm happy to be part of it. Wife's not. Like, what? No. Get away. <laughs> get, get, get an order. I know. You, but most people. We, we, I remember we had a thing early on where we said um, we, just, we asked people to show us what they were drinking. We had to say, show us what bottles you've got drinking. And I suddenly noticed that in more than half of them, there were people's feet. Because everybody watches the wine show in the same way. They sit on the sofa, they take a photograph like that, but they've got their feet on a poof, you know, on some sort of buffet at the yep. front. Yep. And so we then said, show us your slippers. And the people said, there's hundreds of people sending these photographs of their slippers that yep. they had on. And they were like pheasants and Garfield and things like that. <laughs> um, so we knew that it had to be, and, 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 and I know there's a guy, he's a prince in Bahrain who loves the show. He genuinely doesn't drink. He doesn't drink a drop. He said, I just love where you go and I love the stories. So the sort of arc, actually Melanie, who's the producer, brilliant. Um, she had made a show called Who Do You Think You Are? It was kind of genealogy show. Right. In the yes. past. She said, actually, that's the model for what this is. People say oh, it's a top gear of wine. There's an element of that because it's three men and it's, you know, there's a road trip and there's challenges and so on. And then there's those intermittent features where I go off to Moldova or, you know, China or somewhere. But actually, the, a lot of it is about the sort of genealogical history of a bottle of wine. And you find out, oh, well, it started because there was a war or there was an earthquake or you know, some, one that, some very human story. And you, you, you could always mostly make an episode of The Wine Show or a story from The Wine Show without ever going and mentioning wine at all. You could right. just talk about the earthquake itself, you yes. know, or the war. How War so War you always have impacted these. so many of the growers and things like that. Yeah. yeah. So we, it was always sort of that way, but we knew there had to be sort of competitive elements and um, and things. I think it sort of merged. I was about the last person to get involved, actually. Um, I think the the actors were kind of early doors. Um, Amelia, who's my co-presenter, she was quite early on. Um, and I just came in. I got this Twitter message and it was a Twitter DM from Melanie, who was the producer. And in the end, yeah, I take credit for some of it. It's Melanie's idea. and She's the star behind it all. Um, but yeah, she sort of said, I've seen a thing of you on YouTube uh, and I'm making a wine TV show. And I do remember at the time thinking, yeah, loads of people have had an idea about making a wine TV show. And I'd sort of done bits of telly in the past. Okay. Mostly ridiculous things. I presented a, a pop music show in Scotland once and I'd had a little food programme called Joe's Diner that was on in Yorkshire, only in Yorkshire, north of England. We used to go around old people and ask them what recipes they'd made before the war um and i'd have to eat pigs heads and things but it, so i sort of was vaguely aware of this thing anyway i, I kind of thought well, it sounds interesting and she said you've got this idea so we went and met up and, and within a week or so within 10 days we were off filming in burgundy we only ever wanted to make a pilot i don't think it was ever going to be in um and it made it into season one and i buy a barrel of wine in a big auction in, in burgundy right. um which was sort of terribly exciting. It was kind of it was very thrilling. And I think even then it was all piecing this thing together and sort of how would it all work and what, what, was, what, you know, what would go and happen. Um, and, and, but I remember early on, sort of Mel was like, you know, we're not going to be millionaires. You're not going to be a TV star. You're not going to be you know, retiring to Hollywood. Because actually what we spent lots of the money on was having really good lenses and having two cameramen. You have to. And they were really good cameramen. You have to. I remember one of the early ones, the cameramen. Cameramen, from to my money, are like a cross between what would you sort of say? They're sort of a cross between Leonardo, this like beautiful artist, David Hockney, and a London taxi driver. So they're always quite 
sort of thick set kind of blokes, sort of tall like that, you know, sort of London, or come from the Midlands as Jamie, who comes from the Midlands, tall like that. But, you know, slightly scary in okay. some ways when you first meet them with this exquisite artistic eye. <laughs> <laughs> I go, oh, right, just wait a minute, wait a minute. And the door gets slammed open and, oh, and then they've got to go and do these beautiful shots. But then you go somewhere and there's a bunch of, it was a thing with a communist rally that we walked in on. With that big I get guy shouting. told you to get out? Yeah, the guy's like, oh, that was disturbing. Are we allowed to swear on this? You fucking ain't right. Because I'm glad because part of anything else, my mug Atta says boy. get shit done. Um, but yeah, the actual quote was quiet, you motherfuckers, quiet. No speaking, you bitches. Quiet, you <laughs> quiet. Don't speak. He said, wow. he stared down. Wow. <laughs> I was like, he's such a good presenter. We should get him on. He's amazing. <laughs> Cameraman, I mean, I had to change my trousers after that. I and mean, it was right. like a total brown trousers incident. The cameramen were like, oh, no, you know, I've seen worse in Lebanon. Like, what? You know, it's absolutely terrifying. In South Africa, we had this thing. So it was a brilliant, this is a South African story. <clears throat> so we'd filmed in um, the most beautiful group of people. We filmed in a, a place called, it was a Philippi Township just outside uh, Cape Town. It's an extraordinary project where people are growing vines. And there's these matriarchs, and they were amazing women who are growing Sauvignon Blanc in their front gardens and then they're turning it, they're creating this amazing wine brand but even they sort of said it got kind of late in the day and they said you know you guys don't want to be around the monsters around are going to come out when it gets yeah. dark <laughs> totally yeah. Friday evening few people have had a drink you want to go and leave and I remember there was somebody and I sort of <laughs> there's somebody at the end of the street and there's kind of a gang of them and somebody said just time to jump in the car so just know your place right time to go home Joe so said, we, don't worry, I have a couple of hitmen from a Guy Ritchie movie as my cameraman. You'll be okay. <laughs> um, and we did have some security people, but they were so, they're painfully hopeless in a way. They weren't very helpful at all. So any challenges we slightly faced, mostly you got away with sort of just being charming and British, right. which on the whole gets you away with amazing amounts. You're sort of charming and British. Correct. So... We jump in the car and we're going off and the guy said, no, we are actually going to have to leave now. I'm going to have to leave relatively quickly. So um, we're going to go home. So as we're sort of driving along, it's getting, we're going along and there's, the sun's coming down and everybody's got these brides on the side of the road, just kind of everywhere. There's all these brides, there's barbecues on the side of the road. And Jamie, I remember, swings the door open to the side of the van and goes, what's he doing? Because you're all totally locked in. And he starts holding the camera out of the car as we're driving along. He's going, no, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, look at it. It's gorgeous. Because he's doing this slow motion image of sure. us driving past all these amazing brides. And it is amazing. There's a sun setting. There's table mountain in the far right, distance. Right. He's so also he's, doing it with a $40,000 camera. Completely. I mean, if it, <laughs> I mean, I suspect possibly a $40,000 lens. Yeah. It was insane. And... It was kind of fine until suddenly we come up against some traffic. Oh. And suddenly the driver's going, I've got to stop, I've got to stop, I've got to stop. And then there's this suddenly thing, there's a crowd of people, there's Jamie holding this camera, the door's open, like, shut the door, shut the oh. door. Shut the door. <laughs> <clears throat> and, um, you know, I remember driving away and there's people getting, Jamie, do not do that. Like, <laughs> do, do you travel with security? No, not at all, to be honest. Um, we've been to some mad places and I think we've mostly got away with it through charm. I think that's the only time I can ever really remember security. Once or twice, you know, you've got to cover the interesting stories. You can go to lots of really lovely places. Actually, you go to the wine lands in South Africa. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's luxurious. But actually, wine has another much deeper kind of story, which is, you know, happening out in the Philippi Township. And, and it's, you know, and it's changing people's lives. Um, you know, I remember in, well, in Moldova, which is, you know, the situation we're talking Ukraine is having essentially the same problem that Moldova does. Moldova would kind of like to move to the West. And Russia would not like them to move to the West. Right. There's a breakaway province in, uh, in Moldova as well. And there's a very strong Russian separatist movement or sort of pro-Russian movement. Um, yeah, we'd asked this fixer called Viriel, um, <laughs> you mentioned the name Viriel. Now, sometimes people slightly look at you askance in the wine show team. It was an interesting fix. So I'll put it, I'll give him that. So this guy, we said to him, I think we'd, there was that film Goldeneye, the Bond film, where there's all those statues of Stalin and Lenin. Right. And, and we you know, said, Sean is, there, is there anywhere in Chisinau where we can go and film that kind of thing? You know, old Soviet paraphernalia. 
and very elegant. No, no, there is nothing like this in Moldova. We now very much look to the West. <clears throat> and he goes, there is one place. Meanwhile, it's his front lawn looks exactly like that. <laughs> and he rocks up at this car park. And it's this massive wall. And there's Uncle Joe. There's Lenin. I was like, Joe Stalin? Seriously? I mean, he killed like 12, 15 million people. Oh, no, big statue of him up there. Um, it was a huge Lenin. Um, it was a John Karl Lenin Marx. Seemed very there. inappropriate. It, it did seem sort of, you know, in the world of, you know, should we go and have that statue up of somebody who said, you know, if, should we have a statue of Virginia Woolf up? <laughs> Dude, Stalin over here. It's like, wow. Should we start with the big, like the, let's start with the low hanging fruit in the world it, of statues. It's all relative, isn't it? <laughs> really well. So we said, this is great. We'll come and film here. And we said to him, does anybody come here? He says, no. He says, at weekends, you get these old communist dudes who come along and they sit and smoke fags and talk about how great it was back in the day. So we rock up on this Tuesday. And it's when there was that incident. So we rock on this Tuesday. And the place is heaving, it's heaving, filled with communist kids Fantastic. who are about eight. Yeah. And they've all got these little red forage caps on. And there's one with a drum and there's one. And they're going around. And they're all in this parade square with really proud parents who and had, to, who had to shout at them hold for sound <laughs> Can just, oh no got the loop setting on i have to do that i'll tell you a good story about the loop setting in a minute um so yeah we went out and, and we we sort of filmed in so one of the cameramen it was a war guy a war cameraman so he walks right into the middle of this parade square plonks his sticks down gets the camera on Real. Because he was so confident, everyone just assumed he was a Russian cameraman. Okay. So nobody questioned him at all. Yep. I think he came from Kent. Um, there was me and was Jamie, I think, who's the, who's the cameraman. So he, he then said to me, right, you have to do your bit. Now, normally it takes us about 20 minutes to get set up, at which point I learn my lines, because I'm English and I fly and I do it on the hoof. Because I've now got 40 seconds to learn my lines because I've not actually learned them before. So everyone goes, you've learned your lines, haven't you? It's like, yeah. Yep. Mm. It's all about the motivation. <laughs> so anyway, I delivered that piece to camera. And then, of course, this, you know, this guy is sort of rocked up. And that was one of those moments when we sort of said, we need to beat a sort of moderately hasty retreat here and just sort of step away. Because I mean, in fairness, you don't want to cause a stooshy. And International cause a... incident. Yeah. I have to tell you, we had a brilliant sound guy. He's so lovely, called Dave. And he talked in a sort of Lancashire accent. If you ever meet people from Lancashire, you've got a very fruity way of talking like that. And he was, he was getting on a bit. And I said, um, I said, do you, you know, do you, he says, no, no, no. He says, I'm semi-retired, which is another way of saying I don't get very much work now. I don't, I don't get a lot of work. So it was when there was that TV show Chernobyl had come out. So we were, we were actually in, I think we we're in Hungary and Germany filming with him. And I remember at one post, at one point he said, Something and I said, Is that, did he catch that? He says, I don't know. He says, to be honest, I've got my hearing aid in. I, I can't hear. And I was like, you're the sound man. And <laughs> like that. And said, oh, no, I, just a minute. Let me get my hearing aid right. Okay. No, no, we're fine. We're fine. And this, I was like, I'm not surprised he's not getting very much work. He's the sound man with the dicky hearing aid. Yeah. With so we were talking about brain. Chernobyl and he told you, I mean, it's one of those amazing stories. This is one asked, but I said to him, he said, I, over dinner, he said, I went to that Pripyat once, you know. I said, really? So the, the where the Chernobyl was. He said, oh, no, yeah. He says, we were, we were filming, we did a documentary. And the letter is into Pripyat, you know, and you're only allowed in for like a couple of hours and you go and you film it. And so we filmed it. Anyway, we went back to Kiev. And uh, so we're in Kiev and there's these lads there who'd, who'd come from, from Chernobyl. They'd worked there and they'd, they'd come out. And so we're sitting, he says, a tiny little apartment these guys have got. It's very, very small. I hope you can understand my Lancashire accent. And he said, so I'm sitting on this sofa on one side, like the settee, and then the cameraman's over here and they're sitting at the kitchen table. He says, all very cramped. And I got my microphone all like that. And we said to them, he said, have you, have you ever been back to Pripyat, to your old flat? And the guy said, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, go back old time. We go back lords. And he said, what? No, like, no, that the, the radiation stayed down. And he said, no, no. He said, we went back a few weeks after we were told to leave. And he said, but what do you go? He said, well, we'd left all our stuff. We'd left all our things there. And so we went back to collect them. And the guy, and the cameraman, he says, to the, the interviewer, he says, well, what sort of things? And he said, well, that sofa for a start. Oh, my, <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. No wonder he's deaf. <laughs> What's that? No wonder. 
And he said, now you know I've got no children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, now he's got Holy no kid. Hell. He was like telling it like a joke. I was like, Matt. Honestly, though, what a great way to get rid of company if you tell them you're sitting on an irradiated sofa. <laughs> I'm going to save that for the next time I have someone that I'm, you know, looking to get out of the house. I got hey, that I got that eBay. sofa. I got Look a discount that. on that. No kidding. Where'd yeah. you get it from? Chernobyl. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever notice that you feel like you're glowing when you're on it? Yeah. No, uh, my asshole is very itchy. N uh, more than usual, I should say. Very I know, tingly. I know somebody who's a very keen amateur scientist, and he, he wants, <laughs> his wife had to do, go and have some treatment. Um, it was a thyroid treatment. So they gave her, um, it was a like a radioactive iodine, which kind of kills off your, your thyroids, and then you, you know, you have for hypothyroidism. And she got really cross because he, he went and borrowed a Geiger counter from work, and every time she'd been sitting down for a meal, he'd go, oh, yeah, you've been there. And she, she found him in the lavatory. Wow. Like this. And he even tested the cat because the cat had been sitting on him. Unreal. Unreal. Don't let the cat on your knee anymore. It's true. I, we had an uncle that was going through um, treatment for prostate, and he wasn't allowed to be near my uh, my twins. Yeah, no lap sitting. No, I've, you just reminded me because you were talking before, and I didn't get to tell my, my prostate story. Um, that is Go not on. a thing people often say in podcasts. Let me tell you about my prostate. Yep. Um, show, no, you were saying yours, about... we'll show you ours. <laughs> At least now we have a title for the episode. Episode forty three, <laughs> Joe Fatterini. Let me tell you about my prostate. <laughs> He introduced us to memoirs. Remember somebody was writing about a South African proctologist with a four-inch middle finger. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can you go more in depth on that story for us? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was when you were saying about me responding to tweets. Um, quite early on, I think it was just after we bought out series one, this review came out and Melanie, the producer, sent me this text message and she said, Can you explain this, please? And I'm always terrified when she says these things because I've normally said or done something pretty much like everything I've said and done in this podcast. So I must have said something massively inappropriate. And this, this message is a really good review. Somebody was really, really, you know, full of praise for the show. And they said, but it's titled, is this the most interactive show on streaming? And whoever the reviewer was, had been watching it in the United States, was aware that we all lived in, in the UK. Well, actually, I'm living, talking, I'm now living in California. But it, was in the UK and had tweeted something and they said this is amazing it must have been half past three in the morning in the UK and I got response back from the presenter 10 minutes later and I was like what are you doing tweeting responses to people at 3 30 a.m but of course I'm now now what 52 so I was in my very late 40s and I was well I've got a dicky prostate haven't I I have to go to the lavatory three times a night so what do I do I'll go to the lavatory it's not happening got a prostate like a honeydew melon so i just go and answer some tweets while i'm sitting there on the lunch moon river Whew. thank you doc that explains a lot okay so tom he didn't actually want to respond to you he was born. i understand yeah yeah <laughs> and now look where it got him. come on just come for daddy come on let's have it. just a little bit that's you're, it you're that's sitting down your thighs have gone numb you're just gonna hit social media for a while we've all been there mm. There's so um, quite a lot of that kind of thing happens. It's um, it's very entertaining. But I, I mean, we're very lucky. So what we made three seasons now. Um, and if, we, if anybody's listening and haven't watched it, it's me and a, what, an assortment of Hollywood actors. What's a collective noun for British Hollywood actors? Um, sort of. So that's actually we. That's actually one of the questions we wanted to ask you. Um, so out of all the actors that you work with on the show, all the amazing, talented actors. Um, who is your favorite and why is it Matthew Reese? <laughs> <laughs> that is both a, a brilliant question and an entirely accurate That's one. That's all Rob. Rob Rob frequently asks people questions that way and it steers them in the direction that he wants it to go. So I <laughs> wanted to ask him about Dominic West, a.k.a. English Tom Selleck. <laughs> the English Tom Selleck. <laughs> sorry, I can't wait any longer. I'm sorry. I'm watching Rob drink, so I'm going yeah, to... Yeah, well, I mean... Powering through here. There we go. Sorry. He's, he, he didn't want to make. So I am drinking. Let me drink alone, this is which I appreciate. A 2016 Silverado Cab Sav from Napa Valley. Very nice. Thank Weirdly, no, I've got my. I met a guy. He's a really lovely man. He's called Bruce Mello. He's okay. retired. And he gave me um, a Napa Sonoma wine country map so I can 
see what he used to be a chauffeur to drive people around the Napa Valley. So okay. I'm talking to you from Napa. So I'm just at the northern end of Napa City, so right. on the Yonkville side. And um, yeah, so I, and for some reason we were talking about Silverado when it came up because it was one of his favorite wineries to take people to um, on so, the trail. So, so in Joe, fact, I can what, see you, it what here. are you doing in California? Um, well, come back to the, the act question. I've never been a TV presenter. I'm, t- I'm actually a terrible TV presenter. That is I, dis- I disagree. False. Totally disagree. 100%. Sort of so, bumble into it no well, no because it's not forced it's genuine and you're not acting you're just being yourself i totally disagree and when you when you said that it's difficult for people to put wine on television i would agree because you probably have to ride a fine line where is this going to come off like antique roadshow or me standing in front of a camera reading like vcr instructions it, it could be very technical the beauty i think of what you do is that and maybe this is because we're from the States, you could say anything. You could read the phone book and we would be interested. But my wa- my wife, who's an English major and a lawyer, so she lives and dies by the word and uh, you know what she writes, um, she thinks is beautiful. Like what comes out of your mouth is truly prose. Um, and even when you're, I like when you're in, like we talked about the uncomfortable situations and things like that, normal people would react or say something probably that was a little more blue um, you cho- choose to take the high route most of the time. And um, it's it just, it, we could listen to you say anything. It's fantastic. I, I think that's one of the reasons why the show is so enjoyable to watch. It's going to be so awkward when I come to your house and there's me and your wife getting on like a house on the back. <laughs> <talking about English. laughs> Honestly, I'm just sort of sitting there. like It's going to be weirder than that I'm holding the camera. camera. <laughs> <laughs> Doing okay. your bullet tooth Tony impression, Rob. Mm-hmm. Desert Eagle, <laughs> 50. <laughs> That's big. I'm no, the 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 reason I'm in California. So I'm, I mean, it was very nice. And and one of the things I think when Mel found me, the way Mel found me was I was sitting in. She was looking for a presenter. So she knew she had these actors. Um, she was looking for uh, Amelia was already sort of keyed in. So she knew she had you know brilliant sort of young young English you know voice coming through. She wanted somebody who was more sort of wine merchanty. But somebody who wouldn't come and do that kind of wine merchant thing of going, ha ha, right, and trying to sort of make the boringness of wine exciting by being a bit, I don't know. Because it's forced, and that's that's what we were yeah. talking about with you being genuine and you saying you're not a great presenter. That's so Tom got me into I had I I enjoy wine, but I would say I'm more of a whiskey or tequila person. But on the right night, wine's for me. And Tom was telling me about your show probably about a year ago. And when he told me he watched a show about wine, my first reaction was, really? Like, is life that boring down in Somerville, Mass, that we're just watching other people <laughs> drink wine? And then I watched the show, and I remember the first time I watched it, it was like 5 a.m. And my only regret was that I was like, I can't drink wine right now, but God, I really want to go open a bottle right now. Like, I, and it's one of those things, I, I almost liken it, I don't know if you, it's a stupid movie reference, but the movie I Love You, Man, when... Um, Jason, I can't remember his last name, the big guy. It doesn't matter. One of the characters sees the movie Shock a lot. Siegel. And he's never- Jason Siegel. Jason Siegel. Yeah. And when, when later on in the movie, when he goes, by the way, I watched Shock a lot. It was delightful. That's how I felt when I watched the wine show. <laughs> because I thought, and I don't mean any offense by it, but I thought it sounded boring to me. Like, why would I? I'll just drink wine. Why am I going to watch other people talking? I don't need to do that. But if it's we had funny- our time again, we'd change the name, I think, yeah. possibly. You know, well, it, it, I think I, I think the missed opportunity was making it like a COVID date night show, because right. it seems like with what Tom was doing, you had an opportunity there. Like, you know, whatever night that it's on, you know, we can't go out to restaurants right now. Everyone's stuck at home. Grab your wife, open a bottle of white or red, whatever you're into. And let's, you know, have some cheese and wine. Um, but it's funny when I was so we're pretty well traveled locally. My wife and I and our kids, we travel a lot, but we go to a lot of, you know, not tourist destinations, but beach destinations. We go to Turks and Caicos. We go to Hawaii. We did two weeks in Portugal because I'm, I'm Portuguese. My, my grandparents are off the boat from Portugal and we always wanted to go there and see it. So when I watched your Portugal episodes, the wine show, it's funny because I remember watching it going, it's so much more interesting because I've been there. And I mean, everything in Portugal is olives and wine. I mean, everywhere you go. And the cheapest glass of wine or sangria that you could get is better than most of the expensive stuff that I got back home. So this is all a long, long version of me saying that 
I'm someone that's not your target audience and I enjoyed it. So you saying that you maybe, you know, aren't the right presenter for it. I, I can't fathom watching a wine show and enjoying it, but I do. So you're, you're dead wrong about that. No, I mean, I'm certainly ever since the end of COVID, you know, anytime I've, you know, had an evening in with Tom's wife, we've watched the wine show. We, you know, get some, um, the, I'm thinking the behind no, you, she, that she is, is Portugal, isn't it? Is that, that is Portugal. Portugal. Of it course is. it is. Yes, yeah. Dura Valley, which is I, the world's most mountainous wine region. We think there's, there's one person who we had in, she's amazing, uh, Sophia Bergqvist, and she has the world's, it's, 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 the, it's a single vineyard that covers the most um, altitudinous climb. So it, 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 I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's something like 450 meters. Well, in everything altitude. in Portugal is a hill. You go to Lisbon, there's not a flat spot. I mean, everyone asked me what Portugal was like. And, and you know, everyone wants to talk about the Azores and Madeira. And I'm sure, you know, they're amazing. We wanted to go to the mainland and we were there for two weeks and we, we had our three children with us. And it was our first time bringing them out of the country, but like really it's, we've been out of the country, but like into a country and really experiencing, not just, Hey, look, a beach, let's go swim. And it was funny because we went from each coast. We went to the Algarve. We went over to Lisbon. We, we drove all over. We, we didn't stay anywhere more than three or four nights. And we, we kind of hopped around to try to see as much of it as we could. And the vineyards there, I mean, you know, when you're driving at first, you know, you get, it, it, you can tell like, okay, I'm not in America anymore. And, you know, we're from the Northeast. Our kids have been out of the, U, you know, out of the U.S. But in in this area, it, it looks so different. And we're driving through. I'm like, it's just so beautiful over here. And for years, I have always said I could never I can't picture myself living outside of the United States. My wife to this day still talks about when it's time to retire. I think we should go to Portugal. And I never would have thought that that would be an option. But it absolutely is because I could. It's the best trip I've ever had by far. And it wasn't because of a certain site or, you know, a beautiful beach or a beautiful ocean. The water was freezing there, just like it is in, <laughs> yes. in the northeast of, of Massachusetts. We went to the Algarve in the middle of August. We thought we were going to get these beautiful beaches and we go there. And every beach there is like inside of a, a big rock area and there's caves and you can jump off the caves into the ocean. And then the water is 59 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> it's just freezing. It's like Hampton. But it is. It was very much like Hampton. Um, bigger dicks. Isn't but, that why um, Queens is called Queens, isn't it? Isn't it named after Catherine of Braganza, the Queen of Portugal? I'm pretty certain that's why it's called Queens. And there is a big Portuguese community that's, that's yeah, there. Yeah, I think you might be right about that, yeah. Because Madeira nearly became British at one yes. point. Well, that's Catherine like, of Braganza. I mean, Turks and Madeira. Caicos is the British West Indies. That's nowhere near Britain. I mean, I've, yeah. I've been there. Uh, it was That was the first time I ever drove on the opposite side of the road. So that was a little strange. Legally. Me. In Turks and Caicos. Well, yes, <laughs> legally um, and sober. Yes, Catherine of Braganza, she married Charles II, and in her dowry, which involved, I think it was £100,000 of gold and silver, he was given uh, Bombay, uh, which had been a, a Portuguese uh, property, various other sort of communities, trading rights with Brazil, and apparently the scribe who wrote up the dowry um, pleaded to, to, for, with them to take Madeira off and he said, please don't put Madeira on. So apparently she literally kept that, well, metaphorically kept that in her back pocket, that if Charles II really pushed it, then they would concede Madeira as well. But he never asked. And so Madeira, that's why Madeira stayed Portuguese. Um, but it was going to be handed over because I know you go to, um, in London, you got uh, Piccadilly, which is famous sort of shopping streets right in the heart of London. That used to be called Portugal Street because of Catherine Baganza. And uh, Pall Mall, which runs parallel to it, which is probably the sort of heart of the British wine trade in many ways. That was called Catherine Street and it was named after Catherine Baganza. And the two of them used to run alongside. Then we fell out with the Portuguese and so we, no, no, we never... The, the Methuen Treaty between Britain and or England and Portugal is the world's oldest extant trading treaty. So it's um, and it was a wool for wine um, treaty. So we British, British sent them wool and sent them wine. And those are those kind of stories. And you bring that out, you can you sort of throw it in because you don't want it to be a big history lesson. It's kind of weird. You know, it's called Palmar now. It used to be called Catherine Street, and that's why Madeira stayed with Madeira and Ronaldo's delighted. And you sort of bring it right away around full loop to yeah, sort but, of more like the, the the geopolitical impact of everything and the impact of history, especially I, I love all the stuff about World War II, about 
you know, how vineyards and countries and everyone that was impacted by that. That the to deaths, me is the what's deaths were bad though. That's what's that? The deaths were bad though. Yeah, yeah. that's the downside. That's, <laughs> that down, that's a real downer. Real downer. <laughs> but sometimes uh, you get these extraordinary stories that I'm come out of it. Because like, the most disgusting bottle of wine, or second most disgusting bottle of wine I had was a 1943 first growth claret, which was terrible. It just gone off. But we had there is that moment where you go, well, this was harvested during the war, you know, and so it was 43 was the greatest of the wartime vintages. Because people talk about 45, but then they forget by the time 45 came in, the war was over, certainly in Europe, you know, and Hitler had conceded. And there's that extraordinary story that it's a very small harvest, is 1945. And um, the, it was because there was a horrific frost in, I think it was May. Um, so it happened, the frost happened about four o'clock in the morning. And about a third, between a third and a half of all the grapes in Bordeaux and in Burgundy, this great wine regions, were killed. And frost, you know, late frost can be totally devastating. It was at the end of April. Um, so this happens at four o'clock in the morning. By five o'clock that night, um, that afternoon, Marshal Zhukov had taken control of Berlin. And essentially, that was the day that the war was over. And I remember once writing this sort of piece, and you sort of said, it, and everyone, people said from that moment on, it was never, it was never cold for the rest of uh, the summer. It just got warmer and warmer, and there was wow. this warmth that then spread out throughout France as yeah, it was yeah, yeah. liberated. And you, you do find those moments. Now it's total, you know, uh, you know, some people might believe it was sort of God ordained. It's a kind of a fluke that the two things happened at the same time. But then suddenly you realise that there's this wine, and so then that was when. Um, what was a Baron de Rothschild, he then comes, his wife, who's the only Rothschild to die in the Holocaust, I think they were separated, but she died in Buchenwald, his daughter survived. He comes back to his uh, chateau, Mouton Rothschild, and it had been an officer's mess, like an officer's barracks, and they totally ruined the place. There was graffiti on the walls and so on, and some of it's still there to this day, Uh, but they'd ignored the vineyard. So this vineyard has a very small crop, only about half of it, but because they'd not really done much with the vineyard, there's this tiny crop of these amazing grapes, and they're absolutely fabulous. And it was Michael Broadbent, who was a great critic. I've never tried it. Now to buy a bottle is like $50,000. I mean, it's sort of nuts. There are bottles floating around. They take checks or? <laughs> Venmo, um, just Michael Broadbent, he said it was the only wine that he ever scored 110 out of 100 for because it was just so – he said it was the greatest wine of all time. And you do wonder how much of that is the story. It was unquestionably an epically amazing wine. Right. And it appeared – was it in succession? It, might have, it was an early episode of Billions, I think. There's a okay. bottle of it that appears on the walls. It's one of those kind of products. So I love that, hearing you – oh, go ahead. No, you go. I, I love when he talks about wine because he actually expresses something that I thought for years I was wrong about, which is you don't have to spend a lot of money to have a decent wine. Now, obviously, you know, everyone has their favorites. Um, my favorite bottle isn't crazy. I want to say it's like 110, 120. I usually only open that on like Thanksgiving. Cause again, I'm not a big wine person. I'm not drinking 30, 40 bottles a year. We have a small area in our basement where we keep our wine I think we probably have 20 to 30 bottles total, but you know, all different kinds. So no matter what type our company likes, we can accommodate it. But for years I would try these wines that my father-in-law loves wine and he would bring me bottles. And it's funny because he'd bring this one. He's like, Oh, this one's really nice, but it's expensive. And I try it and I go, that's just not, it, it's good, but there's a bottle that's half the price. that's better. And I always thought that, well, that's just because I don't know wine. But then I'd listen to you in the show saying, you know, unless you have the means to buy incredibly expensive wine, you don't need to spend a lot of money on wine because for the most part, you're getting the same wine. It's just in a fancier bottle or under a different name. You know, and I'm sure there's varying degrees for all of it. Some of my favorite wine is some of the cheaper wine. What have you got there? What's, what's, what's the bottle? Let's have a look. What's it? All right, so, That's well, the Silverado. So, so, what yes. are you drinking, Rob? So I'm actually, I'm actually drinking a dessert wine. This is actually one of my favorites. It's uh, Justin Obtuse. No, no, that's, so, that's, that that's line. the wine you brought us, right? Yes, it is. So fantastic. this is fantastic. It's inexpensive. I want to say it's a smaller mm-hmm. bottle, which I chose this specifically because I knew I was going to be drinking at noon on a work day. Um, so <laughs> I went, to, I went to my office earlier today. So I said I don't want to open a, a full size bottles, and this is one of my favorites. So I'll have this. But I want to say these are like twenty eight dollars. Mm-hmm. And again, it's the you know it's a. Um, What's the size on this? It's not a, why can't I see it on here? 
but it's, you can see it's not a full size bottle of wine. No, 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 but this is about half. It's about this 37. is 37.5, 375 mil. Yeah, oh, so this okay. is, you know, it's it's one of my favorite dessert wines. This was one of the first ones that my father-in-law, when he retired, so he sold Audis for a living. He managed mm-hmm. an Audi dealership. And when he retired, he actually got a part-time job at the, the liquor and wine store in New Hampshire just because he loves wine. And so he would he would work there. You know, he, he didn't do it for the money. He did it because he needed to get out of the house because he was bored. Yeah. And so he would bring over to my house all these. And he brought this one. And I remember I said, this is my favorite. And I said, oh, is, it must be expensive. And he's like, that's like $20. And then there's other bottles that he's brought me that I enjoyed. But he said, you know, that's an $80 bottle. And I go, see, that's the thing. I've, I've had ink blot or you know freak show that i think is better and it's 20 25 dollars you know my favorite bottle of wine so, I, mean, I, I work for um, so i'm in california at the moment so i work for it so my day job i'm a wine merchant i've never always been a wine merchant so i used to run little wine shops i now get to run the biggest wine shop in the world so we there's um so i work for a, a, a tech company so it's a uh, called pix pick p-i-x dot wine go and have a visit okay and so essentially it's just a massive wine shop and what we do is we sort of 10 people. So I'll send you to where your father-in-law is, you know, and I'll sort of say, go and buy it in this shop where you can buy it online or you can go and visit. So I am essentially just a very glorified shop manager. It's just, we have like quarter of a million different wines, but it doesn't mean we get to try some kind of fun stuff. And, and I'm trying a lot of wines from California. Now I've tried lots of wines that are hundreds of dollars and so on. Certainly this time around, I mean, I came back after Christmas. So I, my wife and son live in Sweden. Um, I have four older children who live in England so I'm kind of like a Viking in a way. I come from is, Sweden, is, is your spread wife my jeans in England, and then I come to America to go logging and make mummy. Is uh, your wife Swedish? Yeah, my wife is Swedish. Well, my when wife you see is, her, tell her I said, hey, who do? Hey, who am I do? And she'll go, oh, you're more bra. Ganska bra, who am I All right, watch your language, my mother wants our, our son speaks Swinglish, which is <laughs> my, bizarre. It's, it's sort my of best amazing. friend... My best friend growing up was from Sweden. He moved here when he was like four and his whole family spoke Swedish. And I don't remember much of it. Um, I remember how to say, you know, pleasantries. And I remember how to say I peed in my pants. That's about all I remember in Swedish. Yep. I'm now aware of that because our son is nearly, is doing potty training three. So, yes, <laughs> so you pick up on me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, th- this was the thing I've had. So I had this last night. This is um this is my this is the favorite wine i've had since i came here la marea uh, grenache okay. so this is um made by is it ian brand who's a real rising star i think the san francisco chronicle had him as one of their you know, something like the rising star award now this is it's either 35 or 40 dollars i can't remember it is not bonkers money right you know, and i've had wines at 150 dollars 200 dollars five hundred. Yeah. very nice but this has been my absolute favourite. And it's maybe because I'm European, we like a bit of restraint and sort of delicacy, but you don't need to spend sort of potty money. Um, no, and I think that's a big thing that people don't understand. It, you know, they think if you're going to have champagne, you have to have Dom Perignon. No, you. there's other things that are inexpensive that are just as good. You know, maybe not just as good, but if you're going to have it on a regular basis, you know, again, I have a special bottle that I open on Thanksgiving. I, the, so it's Stag's Leap. There's one that's like 120. There's another that's like 300. Yeah. That's the one I usually open on Thanksgiving only. And it's, I have three or four bottles in my basement. I think they're like 300 a bottle. I only open that on Thanksgiving one time a year and we all enjoy it. And then we go back to drinking our regular good wine, but it's not, I mean, most of us can't afford to be drinking $300 bottles of wine, you know, every other day of the week. And there are times as well, you know, sometimes I have gone and drunk very expensive wine. I remember once I went out for dinner, I think there was six of us, six or seven of us. And we sort of tallied it up at the end. And it was, I don't know, we got through, $50,000, $60,000 Fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of wine, or something. I mean, it was some. It's utterly mad, and it sometimes happens that if you are, kind of, I mean, I wouldn't buy that. But sometimes you're really lucky because there's somebody who is insanely wealthy. They have an amazing collection. But the weird thing is, they then don't want to drink the wines on their own. They'd like to have somebody else to sort of act as a curator as they drink it. So I, right. I'm really lucky. I get to sort of rock up as this curator. And the best amongst the people at the dinner was the guy who'd sold him the wine in the first place. So <laughs> Adam gets to drink these wines that he made money And he of. made the money on it. That's, I mean, that's a hell of a racket. That's like a drug dealer getting you to let him sample the drugs in your apartment. He really wants. But, but, is it, but Joe is like the pretty girl that everyone wants to be friends with, right? Because they want his opinion. So he's in the mix as well, right? 
Well, I mean, <laughs> your wife told me that the wines that he gave her were fantastic, though. Oh, she loves you them. Keep them coming, them. please. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you do get those sort of lovely moments. And sometimes you drink all those kind of bits and pieces. I mean, in a way, it's a bit like listening to Wagner. It's kind of exhausting after a while, you know, and you want to just go back and, I mean, maybe, you know, whatever you floats your boat, you know, cold play or whatever the sort of thing is. But, you know, you do sometimes want to just go back to something that's just a bit easier going and you don't have to worry because you haven't spent an awful lot of money. There's a big expectation. You know, you've got a $300 bottle of wine. I better like this. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And we better finish this. <laughs> So terrifying. Do, do, you, do you think it's like art in that sense, Joe, where it's it's sort of subjective or people you could and they've done studies like this before. They have they have brought people in hidden camera experiments in an art gallery and they've hung pieces of art that someone just painted literally hours before this experiment started. And it was just a, a, a prop guy and just painted threw some paint on a canvas and they stand a person in front of the of the artwork and people come up and and the person staring at the canvas convinces them that it's the most amazing piece of art that they've ever seen. And those people buy it hook, line and sinker. So it, 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 is it subjective in the same sense where, where people can say, yes, this wine is fantastic. It's incredible, but it doesn't have to be for you necessarily. Like you said, it all depends on your own personal taste. Does, it, been mean, a does lot it mean you're wrong? Thing. Does it mean yeah. you're wrong for not liking something no. that costs $5,000 a bottle? Not at all. And the, actually, that analogy with art is a very is a very prescient one. Now, there is a thing, there's a famous technique. So this, in fact, this week in Napa, all this week, there are the Master of Wine students. Famously, you're more likely to have met somebody who's been in space than to meet somebody who's passed the Master of Wine. Yep. I haven't passed the Master of Wine. I did it some years ago. I'm when one of famously the a third of, people, third of people who begin it who are married, okay. whether they pass or not, get divorced. So I got divorced whilst doing the MW. It's that challenging wow. it's pretty hard wow. so they're all in here now one of the things you learn quite early on one of the nice things about meeting master of wine is you'd think they'd all be these amazing experts at the top end of you know these sort of glorified wines they're also the, they're actually the group of people who will tell you the quality that exists in an 8.99 dollar bottle of wine they'll tell you because actually that's in some ways technically that's much harder to make actually it's a consistent bottle of wine at under ten dollars it's a really technically difficult challenge okay it's very easy to go and have one of the world's greatest vineyard sites, throw insane amounts of money at it. And yeah, because then they have the it. resources, the resources are there. They're not going to give you the resources for a $10 bottle. And, and also to be, you've got the excuse that it can taste different every year. Whereas if you're selling a ten ninety nine bottle of wine, everybody wants it to taste the same every year. But one of the things they teach you very early on is this thing known as the Blick. I think I come up with it once, twice in the show, B-L-I-C. So this is a sort of a, this is a metric by which you say, actually, you can judge objectively wines and it, it does work because balanced length, intensity, complexity, really good wines are more balanced between fruit sweetness or just sugar sweetness, actually, and acidity. So sweet wine actually should be more acidic. That's why it gives you heartburn when you drink pudding wines. Um, so they should have that poised balance. If they're unbalanced, they're out. Score it one, two or three. Not really very balanced, adequately balanced, perfectly poised. Um, length, how long does it last on your palate? Great wines sit there for a longer period of time. And we know there are sort of biochemical reasons why that happens, um, or physiological reasons why that happens. Um, intensity, that isn't so much how big is it. That's often mistaken. People think big wines are better than small ones. It's not true. It's sort of vaguely held by a lot of California winemakers in the 80s. It's more how precisely, how close to the bullseye can you name one, two or three flavours? So is it citrus fruit? Is it lemons? Is it mayor lemon? So just an explosion of flavor isn't what you're looking for. You're looking for specific flavors. And you want to be able to say, now there might be a number of these, but you want to be able to say that is not um, just berries, that's boysenberry. That is cedarwood. That is these very precise characteristics. And then complexity. Great wines are taste of more different things than simple wines. And the idea is that if you ever get 12, because you give them three marks to each one of them, it's one of the greatest wines in the world, and it does work. I remember trying something and knowing it had to be amongst the very greatest wines in the world because I'd given it 12 on my Blick, and they sort of say, well, look at your Blick. <clears throat> so on one level, yes, you can objectively go and pick out what a great wines. Now, you don't need to like a wine for it to score 12 on the Blick. Right. So it can be massive, and it can be all sorts of things. It can be a bit bitter, and it can even not be ready. 
I remember once doing this with Pinot Noir and the nicer one was the less blicky one, but it was ready to drink because it was a village level Chambon Moussigny, whereas what we had was a Grand Cru Le Moussigny. So, and the Grand Cru Le Moussigny was going to take longer to come round, but it scored 12 on the blick. But the amazing Georges Rumier. <laughs> was it Le Moussigny? It was, the, it was the other Grand Cru. Um, whereas his village level wine was kind of ready to drink kind of now, because it's you know, three years old or something. So you can do that. There is another layer, and there's lots of these experiments. And we do actually a lot of this with picks, funnily enough. It's one of the things that we do. So I do lots of lectures now on behavioral science. Well, I worked in behavioral science quite a long time. So a lot of the stuff we know what makes wine great, who you with? Is it appropriate for the occasion? Is it the sort of thing that you're wanting to go and invest in at that point? Is it with people that you like? Was there the sound of a cork popping rather than a screw cap? That adds 10, 15%, I think it right, is to right, the right. price and value of a bottle of wine. So a lot of what you go and do. And is it kind of a fun story? And there are some wines where somebody tells you something really meaningful about it. You know, I made this or my friend made this, or this represents a very special occasion. Why shouldn't that necessarily make it really, you know, I have a pair of Nike Air Jordans in the Bordeaux colorway. They're worth more to me than any other colorway because it's Bordeaux. Right, I mean, right. they're exactly the same trainer as any number of other Nike Air Jordan ones, but it means kind of more to me because it says Bordeaux on it. Why shouldn't that match in the world of wine? So, you know, and in art, I think sometimes there's that question of what was the intent. And I think sometimes you get that sense where, and I'll give you quite an interesting example. So you could get two pieces of art. In one of them, it's just the janitor flicks some things across it. In another of it, it's, let's say, somebody who comes from, you know, historically marginalised community who is expressing their frustration about the world around them. And they do that by getting smashing some things around. There's a kind of a value in that that isn't in the bit where the janitor went and flicked some paint around. You take two wines. One is made by, you know, great winemaker. The other is made by the first female winemaker in Yonville. I don't know where and, it and it's their on. passion. It's that's yeah. their passion. And, and the grapes were planted by the Romans. Yeah, completely. That adds a sort of value to it. Right. That's not necessarily on the palate, but it doesn't mean it is not valid as a as a sort of. Okay, that's awfully philosophical for me. That's sort of time. I mean, can we not go back to talking about me in a bath of wine or something yep. like that? Here we go. Well, we can talk about Star Wars. Gifting I mean... gears, dick and fart jokes. Here we go. So, um, Joe, so are you? So, what do you do in your downtime? Like, what what do you like to do? What are some of your favorite like films or Because we talk all the time about comics. Uh, TV, uh, films, that's really what we talk about primarily. We have a lot of actors and actresses and people that are in the industry that are on. So um, what what are your top five favorite films? If you had to go on a desert island tomorrow, what are your top five favorite films? And I say top five based on rewatchability. You. Yeah. This rewatchability. Is I mean, there, there are the, the obvious things. Um, I, I, I Because I... I have sort of teenage children we watch a lot. I could go and watch Step Brothers until it came out of my ears, which I thought was a sort of lowbrow choice. No, it's, it's not. That's a fan. It's not at all. You need at least one of those. If you're on yeah. a desert island, you need at least one of those. And apparently Step Brothers is now taught in some film schools because of the way that it plays with... Um, is that sort of idea that the, the the idiotic, slightly surreal characters only work if everybody else plays it absolutely straight? Straight, correct. Yes. And, yes. and the, the story arc within it is extraordinary. I mean, it's this immaculate sort of story art that runs. It's the from. Catalina freaking wine mixer. The, the complete, I have that t-shirt actually. I've of course, I'm t-shirt. so glad. Um, <laughs> so I, I, and I wear it to work. So I should have worn it too, my <laughs> Catalina wine mixer t-shirt. I wear it into the office. And I keep saying that when Pix becomes a big thing, we're going to celebrate. We're going to get helicopters to take us to the to Catalina for a wine mixer. Um, Just watch out for Rob Riggle. He'll bite your dick off. <laughs> I've seen him do it. It was in international waters. Nobody could prosecute. Um, I, funnily enough, there is a sort of wine connection. Certainly when I was young, this dates me a little bit. I could watch Apocalypse Now until, until the end of time. I'm, well, when you brought up Wagner, that's the first thing I thought it was. I, Valkyries. 
Yeah. Yep. And, same and, here. and funnily enough, when we were filming series two, we had a competition because lots of people were really into film. In yeah, the, I in would imagine. So we had this, this competition and it was, um, you had to bring a t-shirt on and people had to guess the connection to a film. Awesome. And I came down with one and it was, um, a, it was a, a green t-shirt, olive green advertising Yater surfboards. And nobody got it. Nobody got it. And I'd had to dig it out. It's really hard to find. And it was, um, it it was the one that Colonel Kilgore wears when he's doing the surfing. And so he's got his it's interesting t-shirt. that you say that. So uh, I'm a big Jimmy Buffett fan and um, he's a surfer in real life. And frequently when you go to his concerts, you know, the backdrops and the stages are all decked out with, uh, they made look like tiki bars and things like that. And he has the surfboard with 101st airborne patch just tucked in amongst all the other surfboards. So again, hey, when you got money, <laughs> <laughs> that is extraordinary. Yeah, there's um, there's a, a winery in the, in Vannes called um, Black Stallion, and it has a lovely piece of trivia. And because Francis Ford Coppola, I'm the only person I think who's ever done a full vertical of all Francis Ford Coppola's wine, vine, uh, Inglenook wines. And, the, and it was I did it in Las Vegas, and the audience was amazing. I remember there were all the wives. Funnily enough, as a stepbrother's connection, there were all the wives of the guys in Cops. Uh, who were, had bought tickets for this wine tasting I did at a golf club in Las Vegas. And I said, what do you do? And they said, oh, we're, all our husbands all appear in this TV show called Cops, which okay. then didn't make any sense until I watched Set Brothers and it's like, why are you so sweaty? I've been watching Cops. Uh, cops. <laughs> um, and I lost the audience briefly and I looked behind me and Sylvester Stallone was walking with two Hooters girls who were his golf caddies. Oh, and he was yeah. barely taller than you. It was better. And he's, he's really small. Uh, and I'm drinking really Francis Ford Coppola's wines back in the 70s and when he buys his vineyard. It's really weird. But when they were filming Apocalypse Now, they, because everybody knows there's Heart of Darkness and there's all their films and it was this total disaster and there's people dying right. and it's really ill. And they had this scene and they couldn't go back to film it. And it was the scene where there's the Susie Q um, girl, the Playboy girls come on helicopters right. and they still needed to film this yep. and they're, as they're traveling up the Nung River. And um, so he had to still do it and they filmed that here in Napa Valley at um, Black Stallion Winery. Awesome. And they totally decked the whole thing up there. And that was the only way they could do it because they couldn't go back. Um, it's not a film, but Succession, yep. right at the minute. That's fine. Um, yeah, we can add shows. That's fine. You know, and, and there wouldn't be very many shows that I would go and throw in. I know lots of people go and throw in The Sopranos and it took me years to sort of get through it. But uh, I think Succession, partly because now, ever since coming in, working in TV, that notion of sort of story arcs and how can you layer stuff in? And there's some very clever gags. Funny if it's mostly written in Ballam, I think, in London. That's where the writer's room is. It's in right. this slightly old down. I mean, it's kind of fashionable, but it's a bit down at heel, actually, it's Ballam. And they all go <laughs> right down there. So I think that would certainly go and, and throw in. I do have a T-shirt that I wore down and everybody, got, one or two people got this when we were filming it. It just said college. Across oh, the Animal path. House. And it yeah. was Animal House. And we were Animal House obsessives when, when I was we, at school. We and then you a look conversation at... about stripes this morning, Rob and I. Your new Delta Tau Kai name is Flounder. <laughs> um, now, this is, this is sort of, I mean, you know, I should definitely try and come up with some sort of, you know, Citizen Kane reference. But I, no, I'm, don't feel I'm, that that's not. Orson not Welles can go fuck himself. These bags. <laughs> Overrated. <laughs> um, so you know, there's a lot of those sorts of bits. I'm going to have a very toilety sense of humour. There's a TV show in the UK. Um, it was the Young Ones, which was hugely influential. Oh, that's that's great. So now we'll know what'll be here in a remake in five years. <laughs> that's perfect. Actually, funny enough, I tell you what you should get because it is coming to the United States. So there was um, it was kind of a fringe show. It's a show. It's one of those very meta shows. It's very sort of flowing meta. If he says wasted, I'm going to lose it. Toast of London, okay. and it is about a, a failed actor who does yeah, it's, voiceovers. It's the, guy, it's the guy from uh, the Vampire Show. I've seen it. Yes, and he's got that very fruity voice. Um, and various people make have made the appearances. The guy from What We Do in the Shadows. Yes. I've oh, seen it. oh, okay, yeah. Matt Berry with yeah, a very yeah. fruity voice yeah. like that. He, you know, he does the voice of the robot on the uh, Boba Fett show, Rob. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yes. I love how they get these characters like Josh Gad did the voice of Muncher in Ghostbusters Afterlife. Yeah, because you need it. There, there was no fucking speaking lines. No. You could have got, Ooh, you, could have got the deaf, you could have got the deaf sound man from the wine show and he would have done it for 16 bucks. No, the, what? Who's the, I'm deaf. <laughs> who's the Sith robot that's got like Oh, Grievous? Grievous? Yeah. I met the voice of General Grievous. Awesome. Oh, really? 
I did at a wine tasting in London. And he's also like a film producer and stuff. And he has this amazing voice. And then suddenly he sort of said, well, I am the voice of General Grievous. And I was like, whoa, no way, this is really cool. And then, and then you, you gave him a second pour. Obi yeah, Wine no. Kenobi on the house. It was, and no, there's a Toast of London. So yeah, you know, Matt Berry made this this kind of culty show in the UK, right. and um, and it features the very famous line, which you will now occasionally see, which says, "Yes, I can hear you, Clem Fandango." Hi, Stephen. This is Clem Fandango. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Clem Fandango. <laughs> and he's made one. It's to do with sitting in the voiceover booth. Hello, Stephen. This is Clem Fandango. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Clem Fandango. Hi, Stephen. This is Clem Fandango. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Clem Fandango. And Larry David, they've now made one. It's called Toast in Tinseltown. And okay. it's one of those nice crossovers in as much as it's still exactly the same thing. Right. But his agents got him a gig in Hollywood. And okay. so he comes over. And yep. Larry David appears in the first Fantastic. of this season. I um, fucking love Larry David. Yeah. Gets to say this thing. Yes, I can hear you, Clem Fandango, <laughs> which everyone is like, oh my goodness. Yes, I can hear you, Clem Fandango. We were talking the other day about how everything is just a British comedy remake nowadays. Oh, so what's yeah. Murderville? We just started watching Murderville on Netflix. What's the original show called? Uh, oh. God damn it! Um, something. So it's 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 a murder mystery, like a whodunit with a detective, but one person doesn't know the script. They're ad libbing. So like Conan O'Brien is one. It's on Netflix. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's it's like the original. Six episodes. Okay, the original was called Murder in Successville. Oh, that's it. Yeah. So it's I, I don't know if you've seen the new one. It, it it's it's a stupid show, but it is wildly funny. The concept and it's such is hilarious. A, well, it's such a great concept, but I, I was talking to Tom one day and I said, oh, it's such a great concept, though. The fact that they brought in comedians and actors and said everyone except for this person knows the script. You're ad-libbing all of it. And he goes, well, you know, they did it in London first, right? And I said, no, I didn't. Everything, everything, I mean, everything that comes out nowadays is a remake, a reboot or a direct sequel. It, or there's some, you know, sometimes do you ever get those shows like Rock Family Trees where they they sort of retrace all the individuals. And so yes, when you yeah. you come through, you take something like Veep, um, you know, Julius Dreyfus's show, and that really comes out of a British show because it's the same showrunner Armando Iannucci. So Everything comes made a from show a British called, show. <laughs> in, there was a film in the loop, and then there had been um, the thick of it, which had been about British politics. But he sort of said, well, he couldn't translate it as directly as The Office because right. it didn't really. Overlap. So, Tom, I think I think as someone that makes films and yeah. is a creator like you are, you're a moron if you don't just start watching whatever is popular <laughs> over in Britain and just be the first person to pitch it to a studio. And I think what you should do is when you go in to pitch it. Yeah. Instead of giving them all these nuances and what I'm going to do with the characters, just go, you know how The Office worked? You know how Murderville this works? Yeah. This will work too. Yeah. Have you the seen the, the movie that came across, um, is it Our Day Will Come, um, directed by Chris Morris, about a guy, uh, I think in Florida, who is hoodwinked in by the FBI into creating a sort of an insurgency. And it's based on real life. So Chris Morris was a, is, a, is a very famous British satirist, famously uh, suspicious. If you want one person to really get into who's a sort of British comic stroke, quite serious filmmaker, very cerebral, Chris Morris is, is a guy. He was a long way above me at school. But Tom, you should rip him off. He should rip off Chris Morris. He made it. I mean, his films are kind of edgy. There was one about a talking dog, which was kind of short film. But then he made one called Three uh, Four Lions, which was a comedy oh. about Islamic yeah, yeah. suicide. I've seen it. Bombers. And um, and again, one of the guys from What We Do in the Shadows was in that. That was where he got like his big. So, so you know how Tarantino likes to rip off Akira Kurosawa? <laughs> you should just rip off this guy, Chris Morris. Tarantino. Yeah. Um, when we were all at school, somebody said, "How did I get into broadcasting?" When we were all at school. There was this legend. People used to talk about Chris. There's this guy called Chris. And people say, oh, yeah, was, Chris was le left a few years ago. Amazing guy. Wrote plays. Famously, he wrote a play about a radio disc jockey who got fired for behaving appallingly. He then became a radio disc jockey and got fired from, I think, three different radio stations Good for Lord. the pranks that he used to pull on people. This right. is like Inception. It was. And he created a radio station and we recreated it. It was called Big Bollock Radio. 
And a number of us who were involved in it are delighted to say it. One very high profile media libel and lawyer in the UK who was also involved in is not at all happy to announce that he was involved in a pirate radio station called Big Bollock Radio. Congrats. He acts for like Brad Pitt now. And so he's like, wow. no, no, you're not allowed to say. Tom, do you um, think uh, Afterlife from Ricky Gervais, is that too popular? Can we rip that off? Can we just make an American version of that? I mean, it probably is. But let's face it, most American shows have to do with a guy that drinks too much and his wife died of cancer anyway. Anyway, so <laughs> like you can get away with it totally <laughs> looking at chris morris has got some kind of obscure bits that you could go and pick up he directed quite a few episodes of veep actually so he and armando similar age both catholics both went to jesuit boarding schools so there's a big sort of overlap there okay. and so you know those kind of shows and the way and like so actually one of my movies and i think certainly of the recent era one of the things i've gone back to quite a bit is death of stalin which was armando's yep, hilarious. Uh, yep. film you know and that thing of how do I make something funny out of something that's really, really horrific. Correct. And actually, as British people, I mean, you know, you can get away with it because you can go and throw Steve Buscemi in and people like that. But then you've got enough British actors, like who's the guy who plays um, Beria, um, who's an unbelievably brilliant actor, and they're just on the right side of, you know, uh... making it really, really dark. Um, but you get away with it slightly because you're British, and so you, your accent kind of carries. Simon Russell Beale, who's you know playing this hideous character, and he's got a woman locked up, a girl locked up in a dungeon, you know, and it's just yep. so unspeakably dreadful. Um, and yet, actually, you come out of it with that I think quite British dark sense of humour, where you go, you have landed the horror of this thing with me, even though I've come out of this actually very very funny film about you know Stalin lying in his own urine. Um, well, look at look at Jojo Rabbit with um, Taika oh, Waititi. What he does, I and, fucking and, love that. And movie. people don't. I, I certainly love. In one of my my biggest influences of all time is Mel Brooks. I was I was raised on Mel Brooks's films. A I Black Sheriff. On, <laughs> it worked in Blazing Saddles. It worked in Blazing Saddles. Um, I was raised on Monty Python and in all those. So, um, but to to understand, you know, people often say that uh you know the movie blazing saddles was racist if you understand film at all if you understand the message that he was trying to get across you realize it's the exact opposite and what mel brooks is trying to do um same thing that taiki watiti uh tries to do in almost all of his films but he takes that extreme level of you know horrible events that happen and he's able to find he's able to glean the comedy from it which is what comedy is supposed to do anyway um and make it take the absurdity of the real uh horror of it and find the funny in it which is what he which is what he did and he's brilliant at doing it have you ever come across um stuart lee the british comedian divisive um and he he, in a sense i mean anti-comedy anti-humor is kind of his thing whether people sort of entirely agree with this policy, and that's a fairly sort of surface way of looking at it. He plays with Brechtian alienation in a way that I have, you know, I think is probably one of the, and in fact, there's some very good, like, you know, people on YouTube who deconstruct his routines to go and see how he plays this thing, because largely he sort of, creates these constructs where the audience you know, you're the problem you're there you know, i'm i'm doing my own thing you lie i'm going to blame you and that notion of sort of breaking the fourth wall and and particularly going and creating that sense where you're sucked in and i think certainly he now gets i don't know i don't think it is over intellectualizing i think people do study the way he goes and does that because now he's at the far end. He, he was very influenced by a guy called Ted Chippington, who nobody's ever heard of. I think he once made a film about Ted Chippington. Is who he related was, to James Trickington? <laughs> no, he's, Ted Chippington was this guy who did comedy that wasn't funny and he didn't care Love and it. he just wanted to piss people off. So he did it intentionally. He did entirely he's intentionally. He's a genius. He's a genius. And he, would, he opened for the rock band The Fall. Back okay. in the eighties, so the he would come out and this band, you know, it's like crowds of people who they'd throw bricks and batteries. It's like at Jim him. Brewer with Metallica, and he would be assaulted by these people, and he would come up and he'd do these terrible, really terrible jokes, just absolutely deadpan on on the <laughs> on the stage like that. And so Stuart then found him. It turned out that he ended up being I mean, he's like a postman, and he just gave it up and he became quite famous. And <laughs> then he was name? like, yeah, I don't care, I'm just going to go be a postman. Um, 
So he would follow him. And I think John Ronson, who's, you know, recently written some amazing books and he's had um, books about being cancelled and, you know, one of those great sort of like Louis Theroux and these sort of English, British chroniclers of Americana. He made a film about a guy called uh, Frank Sidebottom, who was a similar character. Frank Sidebottom was, it, it was a guy called, um, was it, what's his name? Seavey, uh, Chris Seavey who wore this huge papier-mâché head and would do covers of songs, but sort of when a voice like that, and he'd talk in a kind of high voice, and he'd play something, and had this funny little voice, and he'd do this. And John Ronson was his bassist, I think, in this band. And it was this incredibly British thing, because it was all entirely based around a town called Timperley, which nobody had ever really heard of, Timperley. And it was very Manchester, northern English, but he just didn't care which makes it so much more funny. Now, if you do care, I'm, you know, I do quite care about being moderately liked, but actually you've got to be a bit brave. You have to slightly push it and go, well, this bit, I don't care if you like it or not, because this really matters to me. I'm going to go and put this silly line in. Um, and then suddenly you do get a kind of a breakthrough. And I think both, you know, certainly John Ronson's analysis or, you know, watching of, of Frank Sidebottom, there is a very good film about it, I think on Netflix or something. And certainly um, when you get into the work of, you know, of Stuart Lee and seeing how sort of he evolves, and he talks a lot about this stuff. Do you guys get Adam Curtis in the States? Uh, the name doesn't ring a bell. You are going to lose several weekends. Okay. Adam Curtis. All right. So Adam Curtis. Well, Tom will be with your wife anyway, so he'll just. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm with Tom's wife, and you're sitting in your pants hold, for hold about on. five hold hours. On. One, one, one second. The last thing my wife said to me before she left the house, before I started a podcast, was please tell Joe that I love him. That's not a lie. He already That's knows. Not a, I know he knows, but it's my wife. This will be the second Tom's podcast on the first that she's ever fucking watched, by the way. Tom's on the first plane to Sweden. <laughs> in the sense. Yeah, this will be the only that. one that she's interested can, in. Trust can me. I ask Joe for a personal favor while he's here in the States? Yeah. Can you, can you get us to normalize the word cunt? Because God <laughs> damn it. It's, 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 it's our it's favorite. Fucking hell. It's one of my favorite words. And like whenever I watch Ricky Gervais or anything British, oh. the way, like, listen, I understand. Like, my wife is a wonderful woman. She's intelligent. She's smart. Weird, this she's, is a weird segue, but go ahead. She's tolerant of all the bullshit that I do. Yeah. Everything that There's I do. A lot of it. But I'm not allowed to say that word. I say it anyways, but move, I can't. Move to Scotland. More specifically, cunt, move to, cunt move to is Glasgow. That's my favorite word. Yeah. So I it, say, Glasgow I mean, is the only place in the world where it is genuinely used as a term of endearment. Correct. Well, and I don't, I don't mean it as a term of like, if I, you know, if I see a woman doing something stupid, that's not what I want to use. It, it. is a conversation ender in the state. Yeah, it, it absolutely. Really I we need to be normalized. Was... It's my favorite fucking word. If I see someone doing something stupid, yeah, I want to go look at this cunt. But yeah. everyone goes, oh, no, you no. can't say yeah. that. Right. Go to, if you go to Glasgow, I lived in Glasgow for 18 years, for a long time living in the West of Scotland. You and as people sort of know, the West of Scotland is riven with, you know, racial, uh, you know, religious disharmony. Um, there's that famous thing about uh, some guy tried to, there's a suicide bomber arrived and there's like the irony of trying to bring, you know, interracial conflict to Glasgow, which does it for a living. Yeah. That's why it has to have two football teams. It has three for the people who don't want to join in the two football teams. And we had a team, one of our telesales women called Liz, and she had to be taken to one side for, for, for using it in conversations with customers on the phone. Phenomenal. And then somebody said, you're not allowed to do that. And she said, well, he is one. I was like, that's not an excuse. I disagree. And she, and she said, well, no, I just use it as a sort of nice, I use it in the nice way. I was like, no, there isn't a nice way of going and using this. And she, I said to her, how do you know? And she said, we go to the district bar. It's quite a famous bar. And it was one of my customers. He used to look after the district bar. So I wasn't, I, mean, I had some nice wine customers, but mostly I sold vodka into really rough pubs. And when I say rough, in Russia, well, this is how rough. I then went to the district bar and they said they couldn't give me an order that week because they had a dead terrorist in the toilets. I was like, I'm sorry. I said, yeah, he's been in there overnight. We didn't realise when we locked up last night. But yeah, somebody's murdered a terrorist in the toilets. And this used to happen not infrequently. And I once came back from one customer. This is, I'm I, sorry, this is Scotland? 
This is in Scotland, yeah. That's why yeah. they have no terrorist problems. By the way. <laughs> and so they'd all come across from Northern Ireland. So it was very, really, and there were some pubs I couldn't go into because I have an Italian name. So I'm obviously Catholic. And so I get stabbed if I went in there. You just couldn't go in. It's just too dangerous. We've come a <laughs> long way from Magoons. <laughs> it was. It was what the Ulster Defence Association was. That it was their hangout. So you, you know, I was kind of okay because they weren't the UVF. UVF like really hardcore. The UDA classic kind of terrorists. Like, like, um, but I once came back from visiting a customer. This guy actually wanted a wine list, and it was a friend of mine, Jamesy. And Jamesy was always a bit fly. Always a bit, you know, like this. And I came back in, and I was taken into this private meeting room. And I was told to surrender my phone. And he said, do you have any, anything on you? And literally, they patted me down. My boss, like, patted me down. <clears throat> and he said, where have you been? And actually, I'd had lunch with my friend. You weren't meant to do this. And I sort of said, oh, well, I've gotten had lunch with my friend, James. I'm really sorry. Look, he's given me an order, though. And, you, and, and I know I'm going to get in the neck for having lunch with a customer. But, you know, it was, it was like three days before Christmas. And he goes, no, 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 no. And he was ashen and he was really white. And he'd had a phone call from Special Branch, which is kind of the nearest thing we have to the FBI. And they'd been watching people come and go and they'd track the number plate back to our office. Wow. And they wanted to know why I was hanging out with this guy who was a known gangster. So you were um, involved with MI6. I guess. So it was kind of like that. It's like, why are you hanging out? And I said, well, he's coming to ours for New Year. <laughs> he's like, oh, no, no, no. He's like, are, you, are you here to sell rosé? Legally, you have to tell me if you're here to sell rosé. <laughs> oh, it was completely potty. That's just that way of... You've done three seasons of the wine show. What was yeah. it like from when you did? Are you doing? Are you doing season four? Can't talk I, about I wonder it. whether we'd do a full season, if only because now I think you know you have to evolve and change. And making a season is quite challenging. You've got to go and pull. So all you're these coming to the states. Together. Come to the states. Get well, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck to be the two dummies that go around. This fucking wine wine's good, bro. It would be I, I, my, my best friend's Ben Affleck. Um, I tell you, I'm a janitor in the high school and I sometimes think I'm smarter than all the other kids. Um, <laughs> yeah, you said you were British. We get it. it. I can't believe I'm dropping in Step Brothers references endlessly into all of this. It's you know. masterful. We've got like six vineyards in New Hampshire. I mean, he can stay in my in-law apartment. Right. You know, there is nowhere in the United States, in the legislative United States, that doesn't have um, a bonded winery. It used to be the DC. It used to be DC, but DC's got three, I think, now. So what's um, the difference between a, a vineyard and a bonded winery? Uh, well, you can't make wine unless you're in a bonded winery legally, and so and you do need a vineyard. But then, actually, in and Alaska has like six wineries, but I think most of them don't grow their own grapes. There are incredibly some that do, but um, what like two months a year? Yeah, it's something like that. But then there's like quite famous. There's a vineyard in Finland that's heated by the outflow from a nuclear power station oh, and it's the most bizarre we're story. back to chernobyl uh, here we go incredibly that's a it callback. was planted to prove how clean nuclear power stations were their, their, their wine label is just an empty sofa well then they Simpson had a loop. this winery <laughs> so they create this vineyard to prove that they can make wine from the water that comes out of it Does they have a leak really and now prove? they can't make wine that comes from the water outflow that's a it's weird flex the water is like someone saying i can make a steak out of a cow that just got shot out of a volcano <laughs> it was kind of like that. fukushima um, rosé no, I think what we will actually do is we'll come and make it almost episode by episode. So I made um, a, a longer episode with Dominic West uh, yep. last year. Yep. So we Tom Selleck. In- Tom Selleck. But you know what? He, he wasn't Tom Selleck at all. I'll tell you exactly who he was. The Selleck. whole time he was Prince Charles because he's the new Prince Charles in The Crown. No so- kidding. Endlessly as we went round. He was in character. He was in character because he was between bits. But having filmed this, so we would sit in the car and he'd talk, talk out of the side of his mouth, eyes, and he's got his hands. It, oh you, my know, you know, Mrs. Parker Bowles. Yeah, like, Joe, what are you? Or Joe's like, what are you doing? And, and like, he'd, so, he'd come out with these lines. He's like, Mrs. It's Parker a Bowles is a very good friend of mine. You know, and I have many very good friends. You know, wow. and he would introduce you. He said, you know, Joe, he's in the wine show. It's very good. You should watch it. You know, have you come far? <laughs> you come far. And apparently, that's all he ever says is, have you come far? Out the side of his mouth. So we Rossi killed my wife. And I think we may do more of those. I'd love to do a thing. I know uh, Reese at the moment is filming a new season of the uh, Perry Mason remake. So he is in Los Angeles for much of this year filming that. So I said to him, look, come up. We'll find some wineries. We'll go and do a... He's, a fant- he's fantastic. He is. And he's my, 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 favorite. He's my favorite. Yeah, They are all utterly wonderful people. I would say I am closest to Matthew Reese. I love you know, when, when you, you guys go to New York and you go to all the little restaurants. It's phenomenal. It was just fun. He's um, such a ball buster. I love when he, he clearly doesn't know what you're talking about. 
and he comes across as if he knows more than you. It's phenomenal to watch. His family that. are lovely as well. And, and funny enough, Kerry Russell came along when we were filming that and bought his son and uh, older children. And it's we filmed the, the last one, I think, is in Noodle Pudding, which is genuinely his favorite restaurant in the whole yeah. of New York. Yeah. And you can genuinely quite often see him. And I remember when I got engaged to Christina, he took us to, for dinner there. I've never been so drunk in my life. And uh, so we filmed that and his son came. His son's such a funny little boy. And as we came in, we, we had to walk through. And I remember, I've never seen him nervous at all, except his son is over there and is a bit crotchety and okay. Kerry's cross with him because we're doing this. And I remember as we come in, I don't think you can, you might just be able to hear this voice going, Daddy! In the background. And this, <laughs> as we walk through. You know what he wanted to say at that moment? It's going to be a cunt. <laughs> And he's, I met his parents and his parents comes very, very Welsh. And he's terribly Welsh. I mean, his first language is Welsh. He's not English at all. You know, he sort of speaks Welsh in the home. Right, and right. I remember meeting his dad. His dad, is his dad called Glyn? And his dad's brilliantly Welsh because his dad said, hello. And I don't think he said anything else. That was it. It was just, hello. But his mum is so wonderful. We chatted for ages. Well, I tell you, and this is Matthew's favourite programme. He loves this. You know, he's, I think it's the best thing he's ever done. And you're going... And he has kind of won Emmys and things. No, no, no. This is the best thing he's ever done. Everybody <laughs> says this in Cardiff, you know. They all think this is the best programme he's ever been in. This is the only one they all talk about. They don't watch the Americans over there in no, Cardiff. No, why would they? Yeah. He why sounds like they? Mickey's mother from Snatch. <laughs> <laughs> but they all have their different parts. I mean, James Purefoy is a gentle, beautiful soul um, with the most appalling backstory. I think famously he says that his biography is going to be called I Shat Myself in Winnipeg and Other Stories. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, if I see that, most... if I see that on the shelf, I'm buying it. You're buying it. <laughs> Um, he's very, I mean, he's very, he's quite cerebral. You can have really in-depth chats with him. So we we talk about situationism and so on. And he, he used to work as like a hospital porter. He's very committed to the National Health Service because he used to work in it. And he works in his garden and he just like growing his own veg. And we just, I like, think we need to make Joe like the wine version of the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> oh, that would, I mean, what a campaign that would be. Matthew Good is incorrigible and funny and how David many Niven. how many times do they screw do they screw up takes oh, do, 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 like, do, do, literally because also can you imagine the time when i, I yes. introduced the wine and they said what are we trying now now so this is made by a great friend of mine called sybil kunz hey cunt and mm. we it was quite at the end of the day i think it took us over an hour to get that one out because they just could and of course when it came in they're still falling about laughing you know hey, can we get that footage can hey, we get cunt. the uh it's cunt there is quite a lot there's matthew good going sybil like there's like basil faulty um but they just and matthew good actually of all of them is really he gets that point matthew we have to do this um he, he he's wonderfully sort of he's got this sort of insouciance you know he'll come down because he knows that he's impossibly handsome and beautiful and lovely. And he wandered down, kind of late, hung over, wearing trousers and no shirt so that all the girls swoon. Hat on the back of his head. Right. Vape, right. like this. Oh, vape, it's, like a gentleman. I appear to have rather let myself down. You know, <laughs> wanders off in his espadrilles. Um, <laughs> and then Dom, who sort of kind of joined in, I think it was all something complication with Matthew's golfing schedule. But then Dominic West said, no, he'd love to come and do it. And I remember when we first got together with Dom, th these are Hollywood stars. These are serious, you know, they are major league mm -hmm. guys yes. who've got lots of, yeah. you know, crank Dom, The Wire, The Affair. Right. You know, what, are you, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Yeah. So he arrived in Portugal when we first made it. And as you can imagine, the crew are slightly starstruck right. in a way. Right. Um, and so Dom arrived and he hadn't slept very much. And he kind of came in. And anyway, I was left in charge. So there's him and James Purefoy and me. And we're having breakfast in that amazing Quinta that we were in in, um, in Portugal. Anyway, it was all slightly formal. Everyone's like, are you all right, Dom? You know, can we get you anything? Coffee, breakfast, you know, right. mineral water. Yeah. Over, like the, over the pan yeah. stuff. Yeah. What do you yeah. Mean? <laughs> yeah. Like hand job. No, it wasn't like <laughs> that. It was sort of, everybody's just checking he's okay. Anyway, they left and came back in. And I'm in the middle of an anecdote about how Dom's cousin, who I was at school with, he is married to a man 
who has agreed with Dom's cousin that if the opportunity to have sex with James Purefoy ever comes up, he's totally allowed to do it. And you can just see the crew go, we left you for like 10 minutes and you're already telling this outrageous story about how his cousin is allowed to, his husband to sleep with him <laughs> in some sort of appalling kind of gay, weird sort of having a list triangle right. and the three of them are all kind of falling about and then Dom's asking me if I'm one of the guys who was at that party where everyone drank wine naked out of one guy's false leg and I'm going yeah I was I was totally one of them and they're like no, no this is not what was meant to happen oh my God. and I think one of the sort of nice parts was that I'm going to need more details <laughs> so I know in a sense Dom you, know, you kind of know people on a different level and I'm going oh do you know so and so yeah yeah I was at school with him <laughs> And so then when you, of course, the you come out, so there's no sense yeah, of being sorry. You ever drink out of his calf? Is <laughs> <laughs> my friend Jaunty, and he, he lost his leg in a car accident. I bet he wasn't jaunting too much after that. <laughs> Jaunty's amazing. So Jaunty is, I think, the world's only para-ice mile swimmer. So he's, he's big. He's, yeah, he's big. number one. Over it, and he was the first person in the world to swim a mile in water below freezing, missing a limb. Again, so again, Joe, I gotta have... say, I gotta say, what are you swimming from? <laughs> yeah, swimming from? Daddy, I know his dad actually. Daddy, daddy, daddy. <laughs> um, why are you driving away from me, mummy? Why are you driving away? Full circle, we brought it right back. You just left the teddy, and now it's been abused by the boy in the room next to me. You know, it's called a callback, Si. Pay attention. It is. Um, no, we were at a party. It was my cousin's twenty-first, and it started so well. Like a lot of English parties, you know, tuxedos, legs, everything. legs on, legs on, yeah, leg, yeah, leg yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like a Double O Seven movie. I get it. Tuxedos, yeah. <laughs> so everything's really formal, you know. This, well, it was until all the, my, my until the and villain I'm, with a scar under their eye shows up. Have you to give you an idea, my uncle, my, my uncle's title is Rear Admiral Sir. Uh, so is that true? you know. This is properly a smart party. Wow. And I remember with John T at about three o'clock in the morning, two of us are completely naked, having gone skinny dipping in the swimming pool. My dinner suit is at the <laughs> bottom of the drain down there. And he, out of the gloom, I hear this voice going, who's over there? And it's my uncle, Rear Admiral Sir, and, um, and my, one of my other aunts walking towards us. And we're totally bollock naked. And Jonty and I were both sort of in the part-time military at the time. And so as he came up, Jonty, with only one leg, and I both stand to attention. Unreal. He l lumps on me because he's only got one leg, attempts to salute like that, and then goes, oh, no, I'm naked, and covered his nipples. Fantastic. Which was, I've got to tell you, the least cover-upable item that was there. So this naked, you know, sort of massive... 200 and something pound guy covering his nipples. He's only got one leg and me standing like this, drunkenly swaying in the middle of the night. And so we decided that we would institute a new chivalrous order. It was going to be called the order of the leg. And so we filled the cup bit that goes sort of around his knee with sparkling wine. And then all of us all start bollock naked, passing this leg around and drinking from it. And then I think almost everybody had to throw up because if you can imagine that's like somebody's shoe, but worse. Yes, but worse. <clears throat> so you drink it and then suddenly realize that the whole thing tasted of cheese. And it's oh, like, my vomiting. God. And I still meet people at quite smart London clubs and say, they just look at you out of the corner of the eye and they go, There he is. Order of the leg. There he go, is. Another one. <laughs> you guys have like, people you say, have What is that? Thing? Joe, Joe, you need to add a little fake leg to the, uh, the golden. I know we need a chain of cup, office. right? Yeah. Yes. We need to go and put We're having hands. shirts made. <laughs> so there's a lot. Of, that, that was oh, that was kind of. That was, it was a legendary party, and it sort of went down in, in some degree of history. You'll often find British people of a, certainly of that generation, of my generation, would often have two sets of tuxedos, so, you know, two dinner jackets. So you and then obviously is two sets of tails. So you have got wedding morning coat tails, evening really high performal dinner tails okay. and then you'd have two dinner jackets two tuxedos um and then one of them would be referred to as your combat dinner jacket um so that was for where you knew that the party was potentially going to get out of hand and you could leave um, it at the bottom of a pool 
Yeah, and then, right. and, and, you know, go to the bottom pool. There'll be a game of rugby at some point. Um, yeah, if, if it's a rented tux, you can't be leaving the bow tie at the bottom. I mean, so, they're yeah, going to hit your credit card for all that. Never rent a tuxedo. You go to Oxfam, which is the British secondhand charity shops, because <laughs> you get one from the 1930s. So you have these beautiful 1930s suits. That that some widow dropped off when her <laughs> husband died. <laughs> I think at oh, one point Barry had... looks so handsome in this. Let's yeah. let someone else use it. Joe Fatterini can three. drink out of someone's knee. Um, because we have certain codes as well. Because in Britain, it's a real rule. You never wear wing tip collars with a tuxedo ever. Because that's what Is servants it a full wear. Collar? So you have a proper normal collar. Okay. Yep. Uh, but m- maybe with a, you know, with a sort of PK cotton shirts and a placket front. Uh, and then you wear a stiff wing collar separate for when you're in evening tales with a white bow tie. Okay. Um, which is an organization I'm part of, the, the Vintners Company, which is this really properly ancient. I mean, Geoffrey Chaucer's dad uh, was one of them. So his, his father was a wine merchant. And so he, you, you trace this lineage back. And for the formal dinners there, um, where you're meant to eat swan, we don't actually eat swan anymore. It used to be allowed to eat swan. Um, you would go and ha- you have to wear tails for for that. And it's sort of- I think they found one of his cufflinks on Oak Island. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Joe, who takes it the most um, seriously on the show out of all the actors? Um, James Purefoy. Really? By a long chalk. Yeah, he's he really sort of takes it. Weirdly, actually, Matthew Reese also takes it seriously. He looks like he's mucking about. And then... Can he turn it on when he wants to? It seems like he, if someone said... You got to do it now. He would just turn it on and get. Oh it yeah, and yeah. I tell you, actually, with all four of them, and in different ways, I have to tell you, one of the weirdest things about working with actors is that they're actors, and they can suddenly become. They can so completely consume they're another person. They're suddenly interested in what you're actually saying. And yeah, and they suddenly yeah. pretend they're interested. And there was always that thing. I was like, are they really interested, in it or are they just putting this on? And they all sort of say, no, no, we're genuinely not interested. But if you ask them to do a thing and to be in character it's freaky the way that they're able to go and do this. And you just go, oh my goodness, this is so bizarre that you can suddenly live this different person. The flip side is all four of them have really been challenged at the beginning to be themselves. Okay. So I mean, when Don arrived, the Don, when Don first turned up, it's quite a famous story. So he, he rocks up and, and we, I told him this story about his cousin's husband and uh, James Purefoy. And then we sort of go out and we film. He said, so, okay. He'd obviously not read the brief. He said, so who am I here? And we said, well, you. Yes, but, you know, what sort of character am I playing? What's my angle? He wants yeah. I'm like, no, you. And he was like, oh, no, no, nobody wants to see me. I said, no, no, we just want you to be you. <laughs> and so I said, no, just taste the wine. Tell me what you think of it. He said, what if I don't like it? Said, well, tell me you don't like huh? it. Tell me why you don't like it. Be really, really. No, I can't do that. So we, we don't film and we have this no spit rule. So we get to the morning. It's like 28, so my 30 wife. lines. You guys are going to get along swimmingly. So he's smashed at lunchtime because he's been drinking all this. Like, oh, my God, that's something else. So we go, we have lunch. And I think it was a light lunch. It was like a four wine lunch that we had, you know, over several courses in Portugal. You know, two of the wines are port. So they're like 19, 20% alcohol. Okay. What do we do this afternoon? Same again. So there's another 30 odd wines that we go and do in the afternoon. No spit rules. So he's there and he's going, it's like, how do you do this? And well, in fairness, it's my job. I mean, I do this literally for a living, but you know, you kind of learn and stuff. So we get to the end of it, he can hardly see. By this point, he's himself. He's playing himself. Because ah, now it's just fallen off. Now it's fallen off. Yeah. And then we had this wonderful bit where we we had this dinner. I think it was a seven wine dinner. And he thinks, well, good, they finished, I can now get smashed, you know, I've just got to get him a drink. And we got to the end, he's like, I'm going to have to go to bed. He says, I am so drunk and absolutely shattered and this, that, and the other. And they went, no, no, actually, we've still got some filming to do. He said, what? He said, well, no, when you harvest the grapes for port, what you do is you harvest them in the day, you then tread them in these lagars, foot treading, to about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Then you add alcohol and that's how you make port. Like you've got that put one there. So we're going to go treading grapes. Here's a pair of rugby shorts and a T-shirt. You need to have a shower because you've got to have clean legs. So he's like, what? So we're all going to, these, we're going to have a shower. So we're all nice and clean. And he's got these rugby shorts on he's, and a T-shirt. He's shattered. He's shattered. He's absolutely shattered. And we climb in and there's like a band playing music. Matthew and you Fox link Fox arms and you, do, 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 and you dance and you do a bit of ballroom dancing in this playing. To As do you it. would. Yep. As you do. 
to tread these grapes. And it's weird that the exact pressure of a human foot is enough to crush the skin, but not the pip. So you get just the right amount of colour extraction without the bitterness coming out from the tannins. Anyway, after a minute or two, we're also chatting. Somebody goes, where's Dom? And he's totally disappeared. And we're like, Crumbs, he must have like got out and he's so drunk, he's sort of disappeared on his own. So you're looking then for the whiny footprints walking out of this lagar. There's no whiny footprints. And I turn around, I tell you, it was like the hunt for Red October. So this cap of grapes suddenly rises and bursting out like a sort of submarine. It's like, and Don emerges holding bunches of grapes and he sort of stands up like this. And there's this amazing roar and he shouted, I am Bacchus. I am the god of wine, I think, squeezing these grapes and sort of all dripping down his arms, coming down his face. And then launches himself at me and James Purefoy, who are then rugby tackled in and wrestled it right back us like this. We sort of dunk under. I'm a and of course, I'm still slightly holding this thing together and suddenly realise, and I come out, and I'm going to come out, it's all in your eyes, and like, like this. Dominic's rolling around, and he's sort of swimming and splashing about in these grapes. All these pickers are looking utterly horrified because this, for them, is like a sacred act. And we're in the most expensive port in the world, swimming in it, tackle out. Literally. Dominic West is playing the Hulk. Yeah. So then my first look was at the sound guy who's just head in his hands. It's like fifteen thousand dollars worth. So of this is on this is on tape. This is all on tape. And he said and afterwards he said all I heard was because his, thing's mic just is, cutting his mic out. is on. He went under Mike's on. Mic. Mike packs in there. Oh my whole thing God. ruined. And I remember the next thing I looked across at the winemaker. And she's this brilliant winemaker in Portugal. She's absolutely amazing. Portuguese woman. She makes like the most expensive port in the world. It's the most desirable port. I'm looking across thinking, have we just written off hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stock? And she had this big grin on her face. And she was like, really happy. And I, I sort of said, eventually we come out, they kind of hose us down. It's horrible. You get all itchy because all the sugar gets in your pores. It's like really, really that's horrible and I said I'm so sorry about that I'm just so mortified she said this will be the one everybody wants to drink because Dominic West swam in it (laughs) could this be a thing celebrities swimming in their wine so this is it it's the Dominic West swam in this vintage what year from which vineyard can we get this (laughs) as long as they slap the black cock on it we're fine this is going to so it's just before COVID really kicked in so what would that mean this would be a 2019 2019 so 2019 from Duaro March uh, from the door Quinta de Noval Quinta de Noval um, yeah unreal will be is the one so yeah that's that was quite the story but yeah the, the, every so often you see these bits and I've got the kind of pinkish t-shirt on it looks like a sort of weird <laughs> 70s tie-dye kind of thing um, and that was because I'd been swimming in the pool unbelievable amazing James. oh it was lots of fun um, Joe we I feel have... terrible I'm going to have to go yeah I'm gonna go, I know because I could talk to you time. literally all day thank you so much for doing this we sincerely appreciate it. Uh, we love your show. Um, we love your YouTube channel um, that you you were doing uh, online as well. Oh, yeah, one show at home. We should that do was, more about that. That, that was that very was cool. Fun. Very cool. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. So what? So what's next for you? I mean, it, do, it, have you got a, a green light on part four or? We've got green lights on a bit. So what will happen, I think, in the sort of short period of time, look out because there will be the wine show goes to Bulgari in Tuscany. And okay. so that's with me and Dom. And uh, we're going to discover the sort of origins of the wines of Bulgari with, uh, funnily enough, a mad Welshman. And he's <laughs> Dale. Dale, the rugby player, who ended up playing. He went there to play rugby and he ended up. And he's he's actually got a weird Italian name. I think he made it the thing. He he's, he had to play under a, a, a fake Italian name for quite a long time. It's a very Italian story. So here we go and we, we do that. And I'm hoping that actually we'll get around to going and doing some more stuff in California and ups and downs. And you know what? There's, there's sort of bits. We would, I would love to go and 
bring my two parts of my life together. So there's kind of the wine show and then there's Pix, which has only just launched its kind of new platform. Go and visit Pix.wine and play around with it. We've only just launched, but it's um, kind of like Google, but for wine lovers. So, so some... I'm sorry, spell the website for us. Pix, P-I-X dot wine. Okay. Um, and I'm bizarrely a senior executive there. Quite why? Just don't tell them. Don't See, tell them. St- that stop doing this right now. I-, I say this to people all the time. You deserve it. You've put in the time. You're experienced enough. Just own it. Own well, There's a really people- good question. It's a brilliant question. If you're ever doing these podcasts, one great question to sometimes ask people is, when did you first realize you were clever? And nobody I mean, tends to answer that. But you day do. One. Day one. You know, you sort of, you, you kind of, you know, we know sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate and I'm very, you know, it's nice that I get to go and make nice TV shows and I seem to be pretty good at it and, you know, with the, with pics as well. So we're sort of doing that. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, can, if I can fly, you know, this team overall, get Matthew up, uh, Matthew uh, Reese. Um, Goody's always sort of up some bits and pieces. We might go and do some stuff maybe with James in Europe next week. So I think it's likely to come out in parts rather than in one big fell okay. swoop, which in some ways is kind of nicer because we can just tag them on to. I can't right. wait to watch the wine show Dorchester Mass with you and Thomas over here. I'm telling That's you, you come. have an open invitation. When Please, whenever you come to Massachusetts or anywhere even close, we will come. We will put on the biggest spread. Well, probably not the biggest spread. He's seen quite. We'll a take him out to. We'll, yeah. we'll take him to We're a nice gonna, Do we know yeah. anybody? Do we know any amputees? We'll find some. So I'll cut my leg off. Some. Yeah. I'll ask your wife. She'll she'll be able to put me in touch with some people. She did. She said I was very welcome. She didn't mention you at all, but she did say I was very welcome. She seldom. She might not be an amputee, me, but he did break her head. Met me in person. You understand why? <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank Joe. you. We sincerely appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again in the future. Very much so. We, right, we have to do this again because I've not scratched the surface. I know. We didn't even get into the Star Wars stuff. We'll do that next time. <laughs> do that next time. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Yeah. See you again soon. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Joe. Two hours. This was, this was hands down. I never expected this to go the way it went. I Talk about, you know, boy, I, I've met, I've met, a dozen or so celebrities face to face. Right. And they say you should never, you know, meet people that you like, or, you know, this guy, Oh my God, Joe Federini absolutely defied expectations. I always thought of myself as a one man wolf pack. And then when he brought up the movie Step Brothers, I thought, wait, could there be two of us? And then when there was one, there was just me before in the wolf pack. And then I brought Joe in. Now I'm letting you and Gallagher in. I've got a wolf pack of four. The wolf pack just got a little bit bigger. He is, he, he was great. And it, it was such what a nice a combination. Jam, right. What a nice combination though of like funny stories, anecdotal stuff, ridiculous history knowledge. But like, it's so funny to me because I always think like, because I like stupid shit, because I like always sunny, because I like letter Kenny, like that. I, I couldn't be a smart person, right? Because the, smart people don't do that. But I look at Joe and I go, that's a, that's a well-educated, smart person who knows so much about history, so much, not just about wine, but like, you, you, you know, I brought up Portugal. He starts talking about Catherine. He knows everything. Everything. And then you go, what movies do you like? And he goes, Step Brothers. And I go, there's hope for me yet. <laughs> but again, that is, that is the appeal of what he does. So he can get into any situation anywhere in the world and he can talk to anybody, like any, yeah. any status, you know what I mean? He, and he comes in as... As an with this everyman approach, and he'll come in, he'll do his job. He's he's extremely professional, but the anecdotes that he's able to weave into everything that he talks about. Yep. I want him to so do great. my. Uh, I want him to do my eulogy. Um, eulogy. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, we'll have to Indian wrestle to see who does it first. <laughs> oh, that was fantastic. That was great. I, two I hours. Two hours of gold. And honestly, like I thought, like there was not one part where there was like silence. There wasn't a single part where there was awkward, like everything that you or I, like there was a couple times that I kind of went for it with a joke every fucking time. He loved it. Oh, he got, he got it. He was so, there was a couple times where I was like, I don't know if I want to go there or not. Cause he's such a nice guy. So I I went there. I will say this, this is the, the most cunt filled episode that we've had. And I'm so pleased and proud of it. I can't wait to clip the part where I ask him if he can normalize cunt in America. I mean, I'm not joking. That was a genuine request. Hey, I mean, you're preaching to the choir. That is part of oh. the, the most common vernacular. I do believe that he had a great time. 
Yeah. And I do believe that if we say, let's do this again in three weeks, he would do it. Well, that's the thing now. So we'll, we'll, of course, we'll chart, you know, what's going on with the wine show. And if, if they come closer, to this episode is going to be a little weird <laughs> for people. Why? What do you mean? <laughs> little different subject matter. That's all. Pff, fuck them. They either. Oh, I don't care. It's grow a, with us. Listen, we encourage everyone to grow with us. There's right? a chance. There's a chance that after 43 episodes, that 42 and 43 were our two best. I There's know. a chance. Hey, we beat a uh, podcast. We got to 42 and 43. It took him to 46 before he hit his stride. Am I right? The only two parts of this show that we have to edit is the intro and the outro, and that's it. You don't even have to put clips in. I don't. Ha- I don't. I mean, maybe the Red Dragon or a Catalina wine mixer. Some, the Catalina wine mixer? No, there was something else. Do you not fucking else? love that this guy is like like one of the premier sommeliers in the fucking world and he goes around wearing the fucking Catalina wine mixer shirt. I love that he's so aware of that. I, I love that you and I both dressed up and he didn't. <laughs> he doesn't He doesn't even know that it's an ode to Joe. This has been fantastic. I, I thought this was one of our best episodes. What a great guest to have. Um, I mean, we definitely got to get him back on. I, I sincerely appreciate uh, Joe Fatterini coming on. And talking about how much he loves uh, Matthew Reese. Who doesn't? It was a great time. He was a fantastic guest. He was definitely, I mean, I can't think of a more intelligent guest we've had. I mean, just a smart, no. like, knew, knew so many references. And I'm not talking, like, pop culture stuff. I'm talking, like, actual, like, world experience. He's just such a smart guy. So easygoing, though. Like, fantastic. I, uh, I, I, I hope somehow someday he says, Hey, I'm in the Boston area next week and we can take him out to dinner. That would what be could fantastic. possibly bring him to Boston. I have no idea what could possibly bring him here. Right. Tea. Delicious. They're going to dredge it out of the Harbor. Let's it's not, like let's a vintage not wine. Up. Let's not bring okay. it up. It's, it's, too, it's too close to home. Too soon. Too soon. Um, but seriously, uh, Thank you so much for listening to episode 43 of the Two Critical Podcast. Special guest, Joe Fatterini, uh, presenter from the television show, The Wine Show. If you haven't watched it, you got to start. It is an absolute great time. Uh, and um, great job, Rob. Really good work. Solid work. And uh, we will see you again until we meet again. Bye, cunts. Bye, cunts. We sincerely hope you enjoy the program. Please check us out where all podcasts are sold and check out our YouTube channel as well. Thank you for listening and thank you for your support. If you don't like the show, go fuck yourself. Hmm. Ra-da-da-da-do!